Dayton, Ohio. Welcome to my world. Thank you. This Hello is there. Hi, this is Melody. Yes, Melody. What a lovely name. Well, oh, thank you. Long time listener, first time caller, like everybody else, I guess, tonight. <laughs> well, we get, a, we get a second time caller once in a while, <laughs> and a lot of short timers. Anyway, baby, what's on your mind? Well, I took a vacation to Florida, and while we were down there, the and before I had gone, I had the car a diagnostic done, and they said everything was fine. You drove to Florida. We drove to Florida. and From, uh, from I, where are you located? In Ohio. Ooh, that's a hike. Well, we had four of us, and we took our time and got down there and enjoyed. And okay. We went down to Disney World, and we planned on looking at property maybe till future live there. Uh, now you're talking very that night. Listen, like, now you're smart. <laughs> you, you know, I'm a, you know I'm, a, I'm a transplant Floridian, right? Uh, well, I, we love Cocoa Beach, and we probably that's where we will stay. Uh-huh. But while I was down there, the uh, transmission went out on my car. Lovely. So where we took it to, he said that he didn't do the work and he suggested someone else. And um, uh, since this gentleman is pretty well known down there and in, a, in another field also, we trusted him and we gave him our car. Did you go to somebody, the part of a national operation or a local? Uh, local. I did not. I should have gone to the dealership, but uh, they well, were that or to a national franchise that has honors of guarantees anywhere in the country. Right. And I did not do that, which okay. I realized I should have, but I didn't do that. Okay. Well, anyhow, he fixed the car, said it was fine. There should be no problem. Three hundred miles back home, it it breaks again. And how much they charge you? Uh, I towed it down uh, a little over a thousand dollars. Okay. And apparently, it was supposed to be a transmission rebuild, which. I'm not, I'm not sure on how much money was involved, but yeah, that's... 300 miles into Georgia, they had to tow me back down to Florida, and he said <laughs> he would fix it. Mm-hmm. And it didn't cost me anything to tow the car down there because I had AAA, and he covered the rest of the 200 miles. Boy, okay. And he fixed it and um, guaranteed me that it was going to be fine. Well, I left, and I got back to Ohio, and the next morning, I couldn't drive the car. Lovely. So what, now what, what is, is the problem? So now it is sitting in the dealership, and they're telling me that he didn't. He just gave me a junkyard transmission, and then the third gear has gone out. Mm-hmm. So I contacted a floor, uh, in Florida a lawyer. Well, why did, did you wait a minute? They take a deep breath, Melody. Did you yes. call him back? Oh yes, several and what, times. And he, what did he say? He will not repair it. He will not answer my calls. He will not even deal with the dealership. Okay. All right, fine. Well, let me, okay, you touched that. I just want to make certain you touched that base oh, or yes. attempted to. Okay. And, and although he said he fixed it the first time, I understand, you know, it shouldn't have been fixed the second, let alone the third time. Obviously. So here we are nowhere, but the thing that upsets me is the Florida lawyers don't want to call me either. Well, yeah. you're talking about a very minor matter. Okay. I don't mean to denigrate a thousand bucks, mm-hmm. but it's not the kind of thing that an attorney is going to want to get very interested in. For well, the, the thing that's upsetting me is that they want another 1400 to fix it up here. I understand that. So I, someone suggested I call the Chamber of Commerce. That's not going to get you anywhere. No. I, I guess I'm just going to have to have it fixed and eat the... You can it. call the Better Business Bureau, and that's not going to get you very far either. Uh, you would have to go down there and start an action in small claims court. And he'll kill you with that because if he has any brains at all, what he will do is get a... If you make the schlep down there, he'll get a continuance. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, someone you, said it could take a couple years to fight him. Well, I don't know that that's the case, but it would certainly... He could, make, he could drag you back and forth two or three times. Mm-hmm. And obviously for a thousand bucks, as, as much as it's a lot of money... Uh, yeah, but it's more than a thousand... Sir, it's another fourteen hundred on top of the thousand. Well, no, 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 no. But you couldn't recover that fourteen hundred. You could recover what you paid him. I, I don't think I'm following you. In other I words, you're the, you, well, let's start with a premise. You had a bad transmission someplace. Okay. He charged you a thousand dollars and did not repair it appropriately. Yes. You could try to recover that thousand dollars, but not the fourteen hundred that you would have had to spend anyway because you had a bad transmission. You see, and, I'm, and I'm assuming that that's the case. We don't even know that. We don't know what what he did or did not do. But well, I don't. I don't think you. I think you, that your action against him would be limited to the amount that he charged you. Well, I 
thought if I took the car back down to him, I'd have, it, you know, he would make it good. And, and, and I, under, I understand that, but, but he's not going to do that. This is going to cost me to get it fixed is, is a total of $2,500. Yeah, but, but that's, you see, I, this is kind of strange. You were at Disney World, Mickey Mouse arithmetic you're doing here. Right. <laughs> you have to separate the two items. Okay. What you paid him and what you're going to pay somebody else. Yeah. What, unless you could demonstrate that you have to pay more to someone else because of his ineptitude. That would be very difficult to do. Okay, I see. So the the but but you what you'd be looking to recover is that amount of money that you paid him. So do you feel that um, a lawyer down there maybe I should? Pursue it's just it? not worth a lawyer's not worth time. It. Not worth his time. No, ma'am. Well, let's face it. Let's say an attorney gets a hundred bucks an hour. Right. Well, four or five hours you're going to be in to, to you know to say hello. Well, yes, that's true. And there's no guarantee you're going to win anyway. So I guess I should just uh, pay the car up here to get fixed and forget this all happened. Is that well? What you're I don't saying? think that I think those are your options. Yeah, that, your options thinking. realistically. Yeah, I just you know it's really hard to believe that a gentleman that owns a business and I mean he he owns a very reputable business would you know admit to not well, having it fixed. So well, wait a while. You know, it's interesting you say he owns a reputable business. Right. I mean he's a uh, he drives racing cars for a living and that's you know well, i can't understand someone that does that would not stand behind their product i don't know how there's any correlation between the two uh, he's the gentleman that fixed the car well, that has, but i don't see any correlation <laughs> i'm trying to get to maybe i'm missing it what is the correlation in terms of honesty integrity or whatever between driving well, a racing I guess, car i guess it all boils down that this gentleman decided he you know he didn't want to fix my car no i understand that what i'm trying to get to is you, no no i'm trying to penetrate your logic and having a tough time here if well, i were out looking for a credential right. to, to, you know to choose somebody to do business with i'm not certain that the well, fact the that he drove a racing left. car would have would even be what well, it would would be a consideration the reason i left the car was because the gentleman does race cars for a living and and that's that's what i'm trying to get to so, what has that got to do with the price of pudding but i feel that why doesn't he make his product good why doesn't he stand behind it <sighs> melody i don't disagree hold on, hold on sweetheart i don't disagree with that part of your logic right. but suppose the guy um you know raised raised uh emus on the side would that be a would that be a credential no no, no. all right and let's assume that uh he runs r marathons how about that no, but I, well, so I, I don't see what the correlation between I'm just trying to look I'm trying to penetrate your logic I'm trying to figure out what in the world th th would persuade you the guy is less or more honest because he races racing cars well the, he, if he builds you know engines and that's what he does for a living why mm -hmm. doesn't he do a good, good job for me well but, but you see that would not I don't see how that's a factor maybe I'm missing something um, I don't know. I get, I just don't feel it. If he's not going to do this, he shouldn't be in business. Well, I, no, wait a minute. We don't garage. disagree about. I mean, no, we have no disagreement there. Right. All I was the only thing I'm getting. To, I don't want to beat it to death. As you mentioned, he raced racing cars. I think that's totally extraneous. But he, I mean, he builds them and, and to totally what his life is totally extraneous. Yeah. Okay. To his business ethics. Right. Because it's his ethics we're talking about here as much as anything. Right. Anybody right. can make a bad repair job. But yeah. the, the the honest guy is going to stand behind that, that bad repair job and say, okay, I'll make it good. And all I'm saying is I don't understand the logic. Okay, he races racing cars. You know, yeah. I, I buy, of all things, turnstiles. You know, okay. mechanical turnstiles? Yes, yes. I'm a guy who flip a racing car driver. The guy is a very successful, wealthy racing car driver. Okay. But I didn't buy the turnstile from him because he drives a racing car. No, well, see, I had my car fixed there because of the reputation. That's, well, but you, know, you see, why that's... I trusted him. I figured well, if he knew how to race cars and build engines and motors, he would do a good job on my car. I see. That I did see. not work okay. that way. Well, from in in the future, and this is for maybe some folks who may be eavesdropping around the party line. If you're if you're out of town, you know, a long way from home, right? And you have a, a a similar problem, maybe a brake problem or a transmission problem or whatever. It would seem to me prudent to consider going to one of the national chains that says we will honor the guarantee or the warranty anywhere in the country. Right, and I realize I should have done that. I mean, there there is one, there are several chains, and then there's an organization that some of these outfits belong to, mm -hmm. and they give you a list of all the members. So even though they are not owned or, or even operate under the same label. They all belong to an organization that says, yes, I will honor 
anybody in my organization's guarantee or warranty. Mm-hmm. And just it's just something to tack. It's just an expensive lesson. But maybe you're helping somebody else along the party line that says, hey, next time, if this happens to me, yeah. as it will. $2,500. I mean, that's, that's a, you know, a lot of money out of yeah. the pocket well, when you're. It's 1400 not 2400 No, no, no. You got me wrong. No, I didn't. I already paid him. I understand now. that. But your mistake only cost you the $1,000. You'd have spent the 1400 anyway. No, I wouldn't have. You wouldn't? No. Why? Because if I paid a thousand dollars for a transmission yes ma'am on. but what i'm trying to get to is why this, should i have to pay another 14 i did uh, melody i understand that yeah. what i'm saying is you started out with a bad transmission it's going to cost you something right so that you're going to spend anyway so your net real loss here is a thousand dollars that you gave him yes, yes. because you're going to get something for your hopefully right. you choose yes. this guy you're getting yes. something yes i am so yes. in your own mind I see what you're you had a, you had an expense and we're going to say it's 1400 mm-hmm. you got screwed out of a grand but you didn't get screwed out of 2400 is what right. i'm trying to get yes, to I understand that's all now. I understand. maybe maybe it makes you feel a little bit better in that context not a whole lot because you still got to pay the bill now if you if you want to uh Attempt the small claims action, but you're going to have to get down there, and that's part of the problem. But do call the Better Business Bureau in his area. I'm Bruce Williams. This is Talk Net. I have one more suggestion to my friend Melody, if she's still listening, and I do hope that she is. She might want to draw a jot, yeah, jot, drop a note to the uh, Division of Tourism in Florida, because they take a very narrow view of uh, business people sticking tourists, as well they should. They just might be able to put some pressure on this miscreant. All righty, Savannah GA. Hello there. Bruce. Hey, it is I. Okay. Yeah, it's me too. Hey, I want to congratulate you. I see tonight you're back on the local Savannah station. You were in a hiatus over in Hilton Head for, I don't know, about a year or so, I guess. Is that right? Yeah. So well, anyway, so I, I guess it's through popular demand. <laughs> No, I, what I what station? Are, let's let's say hello to them. What station? Uh, WBMQ. Alrighty. It's a local talk radio station, and they they had you, and then uh, uh, I think one of their competitors must have undermined them. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I'm, I'm glad I we we could hear pick it up uh, on the other channel, but uh, certainly have listened to you for many years. Uh, we've moved around the United States quite a bit, and uh, I seem to be able to pick you up most places. Well, we're pretty much at the country covered, yeah. but I appreciate it, my friend. A- what anyway, can I do you out of tonight? Okay, uh, I work for a construction company, a, a contractor, and we've moved around, as I said, the United States uh, several places, and. Anyway, we end up being kind of pigeonholed on the East Coast, and we are from the West Coast. There are worse places to be. Yeah, well, no, no, hear me out. I agree. But anyway, <laughs> where, in the, uh, where in the West Coast are you from? Uh, Pacific Northwest, state oh, of Washington. But, oh, yeah, it's a lovely part okay, of the world. Okay, so anyway, uh, my uh, uh, son's ages and all that told me that it's time to go back and uh, let him come up in an in a area and an atmosphere that we're accustomed to. All right. Nothing wrong with the area we're in, except it's just not what our reference points are. Okay. All right. So anyway, uh, working for a contractor who has offices uh, at times at various points, we, we locate where we have work. Mm-hmm. And I'm I'm a field type person. Just uh, nas- uh, international occupation no. or just national? Uh, it's it, well, U.S. of A. No, okay. He okay. They don't do all over the world. We're not, it's not like Bechtel that goes. No, all no, over no. The we're not. We're just a small contractor, but we're specialty. So we we hmm. set up camp where we get work. So we know what's your specialty? Uh, it's marine construction. We we uh, work on in shipyards, mostly uh, military, commercial. Uh huh. Anyway, it's it's a small little little niche, but well, it's uh, a good one, I guess. Well, it's a dying industry, actually. Is that right? Yeah. Well, in this country building ships is a dying industry, yeah. not in not in other parts of the world. Well, it's you know now I've got some revitalization uh, with the uh, gaming boats. That's the the new blood. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, the the, the the ones that don't go anywhere. Right. Yeah. As, I, as contra- the ones they use in is in, in uh, the, up, up, up the Mississippi. Yeah, the Gulf I think. Coast area. That's where it's. Yeah. And then actually, they're going up the Mississippi, and they're getting up the Great Lakes. I think now. But it's just a matter of what the laws allow. Yeah, but don't they also have the ones that don't go anywhere? Uh, Louisiana, I know, has right. boats that are never yeah. going to go anywhere, but they got to be on the water, which is kind of stupid. When you well, think the about rules. It. Uh, have been changed, stretched to, to fit the situation. Exactly. Yeah, you know they declare that it's too too rough out. We can't leave the dock today. <laughs> well, the one that I know, I think it's in uh, Shreveport. That's never leaving the dock yeah. ever. 
because they had to dredge it out just to pull it up there. Right. And it, I think it's in, is it Mississippi where they have these big flat jobbies that in in the swamp that are never going to go anywhere either, but they got to be, t and you got to have a captain and crew too. Well, uh, even though on New Orleans they're in Lake Pontchartrain, I believe. Is that right? Yeah. Anyway, I, I'm not directly associated with that activity. I'm, you know, but I'm in the company I'm with is. Uh -huh. Anyway, what, what I've done is in order to uh, force the issue, I've decided that not only if, if I don't do anything on my own, I'll be uh, where I'm at on this job for another four or five years. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, my wife and I decided uh, uh, just the time to make our move. So we sold our home, uh, moved to the West Coast, uh, have built a house, have moved into it. I'm still working here. I have mm -hmm. a job. I plan to keep working for the same company. Until uh, such time as you can get something up there. Huh? Well, uh, actually, what I'm trying to do is play... Uh, I guess I have your cake and eat it, too. I have informed them what my plans are. Uh, I would like to get employment by them, you know, in that area. Uh -huh. I'm not going to be working out of my house. I hear you. Whereabouts in the West Coast? Wait, what, what city? Well, uh, we're near Portland, Oregon, but it's a small little town. Okay. I'm just curious. I know the area, you know, reasonably well. All right. All right. Anyway, I don't want to get too many details. No, that's here, okay. That's okay. Anyway, but it, it's a little, little small. Used to be fishing and logging down until the industry went by way of the buffalo. <laughs> and uh, anyway, so we have moved there. I'm working here until something else arises within the company I'm in. That's uh -huh. my intent. I don't want to shift gears. I'm, I'm content. I like my work, uh, but the location, uh, uh, time-wise, it was ready to move. So what I've done, I've moved them. I've informed the company that I would like to get a, you know, work for them, continue working for them in a different capacity, a different mm -hmm. location, or travel really? lot, or what, do whatever. And how do they take all that? Well, they don't make a decision until they have to. Right now, I have a job here. Nothing's going to change. I'm not on a, a timeline that says, you know, on day X I have to leave. I'm I'm trying to okay, recognize well, how, their situation too. How do you how do you bring it to a head? I mean, you don't want it to go on four or five years. No, I don't. Uh, but uh, after the first of the year, I, I plan to start promoting my situation again, and they're understanding. I just want to make sure that I don't cut my own throat. But indeed. Anyway, on the other hand, you do it, and you figure out how to how to make it work. I don't disagree. You're my kind of guy. Well. <laughs> Yeah, that's called flying blind, where I come from. Well, that's another program. I've, I've been known to do that, too. Yeah. So anyway, what uh, what I'm actually I'm asking, and, and this might be a foolish question if I'd maybe done some of my own homework, uh, when it comes tax time, I say, well, I've I moved my family on my own. Uh, I, I could say because I knew we were going to move, I didn't want to move gonna my happen. kids. If you're, if you're talking about you know, it's the it's a, a a moving expense because of business related, right? No, I don't think so. Okay, well, I, I think if the if if the facts were put exactly as I've told you, I'd agree with you. And I, uh -huh. You know whether I could you know whether they could be tainted or it might not be worth the effort. But I definitely know that uh, by doing it, uh, work reasons, I could be living in Savannah. And end up being, a, you know, on a job in, let's say, New Orleans uh, yeah. for six months, and you know, be commuting once a month or once every six weeks back to here. So, the type of work, you know, whether I'm living in Kansas or, or state of yeah, Washington. I understand what you're saying, but I think you'd have a. And listen, you don't. I'm, I'm not the examiner. You have to persuade me. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm not. I'm, actually, I'm kind of. You know, probably I'm, I'm barking up a tree here. <laughs> <laughs> I think I got a feeling you're inviting an audit. Yeah. And probably, the, I look at the total dollars involved, you know, probably by the time we got done, we moved ourselves. We did it like you had to clamp it, you know, and had a, had a rider truck. <laughs> like your style. But, you know, <laughs> but we did it. That's the only way you do, you, if you do it, you got to do it. I and, understand. And anyway, uh, you know, by the time you get done, I, I tried to get my company to show a little interest and whatever. And, you know, of course, they took the business type approach that says, well, they really don't see any benefit in for them. If we had a job there, that's another story right mm. now. Odds are we'll get one in the area shortly. Yeah, but I don't see where you, at this point, uh, in anticipation of a possible move, I don't see I don't see where that's going to stand. But look, let's put it this way. Suppose you do it on your income tax, right? Yeah. All you can do is have it knocked off and pay the tax and pay the interest. That's true. You're, you're not trying to beat them. You're not, you're not even doing something illegal. You're saying this, this is your interpretation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's the point. Actually, I haven't really looked at it. You haven't got it. I just been, you know, you start plotting and scheming ahead of time. I hear you. Probably I'll burn out by the time I get to it. <laughs>
<laughs> I do wish you well, guys. All right. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Good you. talking with you. Either place will try to keep you company. All right. Thank you. I'm Bruce Williams. Okay. Hang in. This is Talk Net. Burlington, South Carolina. Hello there. Yes. Uh, well, it's Burlington, North Carolina. My well, name is... well, they just told me South Carolina. What can I tell you? North Carolina. I apologize. Yeah. What's up? Uh, my name is Sharon. Uh, I'm calling in reference to the uh, phone call last night. I didn't catch the first part of it. Well, we had um, a lot of phone calls last night. Yeah. Which one, Sharon? Well, the guy uh, that was calling about having a problem with a neighbor's cat. Yes, yes, yes. He had okay. two cats of his own and a cat door. And the neighbor's cat kept coming through the door and, and literally, if you'll pardon me, crapping all over his house. Yeah. And the neighbor refuses to do anything about it. Okay. Well, I was telling the guy that... That works the phones um, at your office. Right, let's um, call my producer. Okay, your producer. Um, kind of upset about it. I mean, I have six cats of my own, and you're a real cat person, huh? Uh, well, I like. We've had dogs too. I mean, animals. Period. And mm -hmm. uh, the thing that got me, I was so upset this morning that I called the station that carries your program, and oh my goodness. you know, you didn't directly tell the guy to do. To do the cat in, yeah, I did. I, I can't tell him directly to do the cat in, but I would, I would eliminate that cat. Okay, well, just as let me be in, in all candor, and I was wrong, but years ago, one of my dogs was constantly going next door, and I just didn't control that dog, and the neighbor shot him. Okay. And I really couldn't get. And as much as I loved that dog, it was my responsibility as an owner to keep that dog on my property. Right. And, okay. he, and he had every right to, to do what he did. Okay, well, I'm not arguing beyond that. You know, yes, the donors should be responsible, but you have a lot of irresponsible people in this country. That's they true. don't take care of their animals. They don't take care of their children. You know, we, that's there's no, we have nothing to argue about that. Nothing. The thing is, I'm talking about, you know, what, what did the guy mean? It's going to be a painful way. The, the thing that gets me, though, you you know, I don't know. Okay, you said you you told him whatever. But I well, I told, let us recap. So I'll tell you what I told him. First of all, and a lady called up with a kind of an interesting idea. She said there, there are, uh, you know, cat doors, pet doors right. that are activated by a collar around the pet's neck. I had not known about that. And that might be an answer. Might right. be an answer. But the point is, what I said I would do is take my two cats, which he, this other cat is attacked, by the way, right. and put them in cages inside the kitchen so that they would be safe when this interloper came in. And once he came into the house, I would do him in. Okay, well, let me let me make one comment on that. Sure. Okay. What I would have told the guy, see, a lot of people listen to you. Okay, you have a responsibility on yes. some of the people that call in. Whatever you say, you could tell them to jump off a cliff, and they probably would do that. Well, I would hope not. But, well, okay. but what is your point, Jim? My point is, he could have contacted, at the, you know, if you don't want to contact the Humane Society or PETA, they, they know a lot about animals. Okay, they could have contacted the local animal shelter, the animal yeah. control officers, and they right. would have simply picked the cat up. And they then would what? have talked to the owners, and if they didn't, you know, correct the situation, Immediately, the animal would have been picked up, okay? I don't believe that for a moment. Well, I know that because I work with animal control well, but, officers. But, but you see, you're, you're making a general statement. And I, and I, and I know, you know as, as you may know, I was a mayor for a while and that kind of stuff. And we had a guy, Harry, that was an extremely dedicated uh, animal control officer, right? But then we had some others that, uh, well, did you read that thing in Hillside, New Jersey about three months ago? Where the guy, where the this elderly man trapped and killed a rat, and the guy they gave him a summons for killing the rat. Okay, they well, said they should have trapped him humanely and turned him loose someplace else. The judge laughed the guy, the, the humane society guy, out of court. Fortunately. Okay. Well, I work with animal groups locally, and I've, I've worked with, with the con control officers, and we had trouble with some of the officers here. And what you do, the, here at the police department, they oversee the shelter, and the people that work there. They were having problems with, were dismissed, okay? okay. You're, you're, look, your point is well taken. The, the point uh, is, what, is the guy, what did the guy mean by it's going to be a painful way to get rid of him? He doesn't have the, you know, that isn't for right. Him, I guess. He's painful going to what? Would be painful for him to do this. Pa or physically painful for the animal. Yeah, I don't, but that may you well know? be. Uh, but you see, the problem is, and I am, as you are, an animal lover as we speak. My Mickey the Mud is laying here in the studio. I'm not necessarily a cat lover, candidly, but my daughter has a couple of cats which I care for when she travels. No problem with that. The fact is, here's a cat that's coming into somebody's house and literally blanking all over the house. Fine. He, now, that's not something that you can tolerate for two minutes. Fine. Well, animal, control, animal control would pick up the candle. Tell me but, that it wouldn't okay. because... Okay. Your point is well taken. Maybe you should call them first. There's a only problem I have with that is if they don't do their job, 
then you're on record as making a complaint, and then the guy starts making a complaint about his cat disappearing, you may have a problem. I'm trying to be a realist. It's well, not a perfect. It's not a perfect world. I'm talking. I I know it isn't, but I know what people do to animals because I've seen it firsthand. Mm -hmm. Okay, in shooting or whatever the heck he was talking about doing, that isn't right. Okay, it's, we're talking about a small cat here, and yes, the animal control officers would handle the situation. Well, and if you not, see, right, you find well, out who. You the find problem out is who you're making. You're shelter. making. Okay, I, what I'm trying to get to, and I, I don't know that we have we're that far apart, is that your position is that the the, the well, or I might put it another way. Your position is that the animal control officer should be brought into it, and you may be right. My problem with that is if they don't do their job, and then you go out and do a job, well, if you are on record as being the protagonist here, and I don't want to put my, my, myself in that position. Well, Simple fine. as that. If they don't do their job, then who is over the shelter in the guy's oh, city? But, but, yeah. but you can't, but you see, you're, you, you, I'm not going to make it my life's work to have somebody pick up a stray cat. Well, it, I'm going to bang the cat. That's the end of that. Well, it shouldn't be, you know, a life's work. And I think an animal is worth the effort. You know, they're put here on the earth just like people. Well, I guess that's where we disagree. I, I, I like to think that I'm an animal lover, but I wear leather shoes and I'm a cannibal. I eat the animals. I, and I'm not a vegetarian. I have, you know, a steak from time to time. Well, I, you know, don't don't take me as some kind of nutty fanatic or something. Well, seriously. I'm, I'm, you know, I, 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 I like to not try to, I, I'm not suggesting. I'm I believe suggesting. in the decent treatment of animals and people. That is a fanatical. That's just, I think that's normal. I, okay? well, I never use the word fanatical. Animals feel pain. They feel, they, they, they're scared. They get scared like people. They feel all the feelings that we feel. Without, that maybe they don't go to college or something. Without any question. But, but they we, are also, to, we are to take care of animals. We are not to abuse them. And the guy could have handled it a different way. And God only knows what he did with the animal today. I, dis I don't disagree. I'm saying you have a responsibility. When, when you have that much of... When people call you and that many people listen to you, and you know there are crazy people out there. You know the people that don't give a rat, you know what, mm -hmm. about how they treat people or animals. You know that. This is true. But I could only respond in what I would do under similar circumstances. And, I, and I, I'm not telling someone else to do that. Well, but I would I, never. I'm an I would, animal lover. Well, but I understand that. You, and there's a lot of people that would never. And I'm sure my daughter is my daughter is one of those people. I can't imagine Kelly doing that at the because she is very, very tender when it comes to animals. I like to think I am reasonable, but there's no way in the world that I would tolerate uh, a, a cat that repeatedly came into my home and made a mess out of it. And if the, if the owner of that cat wasn't responsible, I would do whatever I had to do to protect my property and my animals, because as he pointed out, his animals can't go outside because this guy's attacking them. Good luck there. And, and by the way, I don't know that in most communities there's any uh, leash law with regard to cats. And I'm not sure the SPCA or anybody else could tell you you can't let your cat roam, which is a whole other program. But you've had your say, and I appreciate your interest. I'm Bruce Williams. This is TalkNet. Hello there, Houston. It's your turn in my world. Welcome. Yes, sir. This is John from Houston. Yeah, John. Thank you for your patience. Yeah, no problem. Um, approximately two to three weeks ago, you had a lady call up about scholarships. Um, she was planning on sending, I think it was $49 for a scholarship, sir. Well, we've had two or three calls subsequent to that as well, yes. Well, these are these services that say, for whatever the number is, and, and, and in one case it was $65, Okay. They will send you X number of scholarships for which you are qualified, not necessarily you will get. But the one that really got to me was where they were supposed to send in like 300 bucks, but they guaranteed you at least $1,000 in scholarship money, which I think is pretty hard to do. Yes, that's what um, I did. That I did. I did. Um, well, actually, my grandfather gave me uh, $49 to do the scholarship search, uh -huh. and they, they send a... Uh, paperwork for you to fill out. And they send you a form to tell you all this, this information about you to see where you fit. Yes, sir. And uh, I filled that out and I sent it back and uh, mm -hmm. about approximately, I would guess about three to four weeks later, this was my freshman year of college, mm -hmm. I received about 20 to 30 uh, sources back. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the requirement with the scholarship program that I had was that you had to send off to every one of the scholarship things yeah. and get a reply from them. Mm -hmm. The only thing was they, the sources that they gave me, um, half of them I didn't qualify for. But to get well, them... Well, 
let me let me ask you this, John. Give me yes. just one example of a qualification you didn't meet. Uh, um, minority status. Okay, that's certainly one. That's that be thought. Of. Go ahead. And uh, yeah, there were some, and I'm I'm a white male, and there are a couple that were for females hmm. only. And, and, they, and they did a very poor job in in, in providing this stuff from your when you're from your uh, data sheet. Yes, sir. And uh, to get the uh, five hundred dollar guarantee or the five hundred dollar guarantee that they had, yeah. you had to send a letter to every one of these scholarships, or you had to send an application, fill out their application, mm -hmm. and. Uh, then get a reply, a rejection letter from them. Uh -huh. And uh, the only thing, I mean, sending 20 to 30 letters, I mean, I was, I was lazy on it at that, but to scholarships that you knew, even they said so on the little source sheet that they filled out. Um, they say they said you'd be restricted to female applicants, yeah, for example. Yeah, they said it on there. Well, then it would be clearly uh, a, a waste of time for you to send that in. Yeah, it'd be a waste of time, but still, I would have to do that. Well, to get the, you, but you see, that I don't know that we can condemn all of these search outfits because some, I think, do a credible job. Yeah. And others do not. But when they start to guarantee that you will get money or your money back, I want to know who's going to guarantee those rascals are in business next week. John, thank you very much for your call. It's been a good hour, my friends, and you've made it so. I'm Bruce Wiggins. This is Talknet. An animal lover. Boy, she has a, you know, the little door thing. Mm -hmm. And it goes into an, uh, her yard. She had enclosed in every dimension. with So you, because the roof, there's a roof on the yard. Mm -hmm. You know, not the whole yard. But there's a run out there that the uh, chain metal, so the cats can go out there and not be exposed to other animals. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, she's willing to spend the money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, my, uh, my problem is quite a bit different. Yes, um, sir. I've been sending out resumes for um, a, a good three years or more mm -hmm. um, and getting virtually no replies from anyone. And as I was telling your assistant, I've, uh, I've tried rearranging resumes any number of different well, ways. Do you um, know that my opinion of resumes is right there with whale excrement? Really? The bottom of the sea. What is your, uh, in your opinion, what's the best way to, to go after a, a position? Because I have... Um, well, what type of job are you looking for? Well, um, it doesn't so much matter the, the industry exactly. Um, uh, what I've mostly been going after is customer service kinds of jobs uh, and some, some, um, some mail kinds of jobs. Uh, what does that mean, mail jobs? I mean, like uh, mailroom manager, um, things such as that. Well, in three I, years, though, you haven't found a job. Uh, nothing I could afford to take. I've had very, very few offers. Uh, uh, did, so you've been unemployed for three years? Oh, no. I've, I'm, I've been working for a financial services company for ten and a half years and seeking to make a change. Oh, I see. Um, for situations in the company and um, downsizing and all that sort of thing. Yeah. Well, you see, you have to reach the decision maker. Mm -hmm. You don't reach them by sending unsolicited or even solicited resumes. Mm -hmm. You reach it by sending a personal letter to somebody with something in that letter that captures their attention. Mm -hmm. Well, that's it. In other words, you have to find somebody in that company. If, let's assume, it, for the sake of discussion, it's in this mailroom situation. Somebody in that company is in charge of the mailroom. Mm -hmm. Or in charge of, of staffing it or whatever. Right. Well, that's the guy or gal you got to get to. Mm -hmm. And you've got to write them it, it, or either a personal letter or call them, make an appointment, whatever it happens to be. Yeah. And you got to impress upon them very quickly that you're worth talking to. Mm -hmm. And they don't have time to wade through three or four pages. At least if they're like me, they don't. Yeah. Well, uh, for that reason, I've uh, for a long time kept my resumes to one page and such. Um, but I don't want to, you see. I don't give a damn about your resume. Yeah, a letter. Re to, uh, see, a resume very... tells me that you don't care very much about me. Mm -hmm. You're sending me the same resume you sent 50 other people or 150 other people. Mm -hmm. I, I want... do try to customize them, but uh, but I get but if I guess in your if your experience is how would I know that? Hmm. How would I know it's customized? Uh, I don't know. A letter to me with my name on top says, hey, you're right. You're writing to Bruce Williams. Mm -hmm. And that first paragraph, there better be something in there that tells me you know something about me. Okay. I, the, one of the things I get the largest kick out of, and it has nothing to do with jobs, mm -hmm. but it's letters from Flax, PR people. Mm -hmm. And the first thing they got in the top of their, their, their thing is, we got the greatest guest for your show. Yeah. What does that tell me? It tells me I've never heard my show. Because if they had, they know I don't do guests. Okay. Well, <laughs> yeah. That goes in the trash, or at least they send their, their posted thing back 
uh, just so they had to spend the money in the postage, uh, you know, like the uh, postpaid envelope or whatever. But it just, it aggravates me that they are so presumptuous as to contact me and don't even know enough about my show to know they don't do guests. Yeah. Well, let me ask you this. I mean, if a company uh, specifically advertises um, a position that I'm interested in, I send them and they specify, I send their resume. Then you got to send their resume, but there's also ought to be a letter in there. I do. I always send a letter. But well, what does the letter say? The letter says... Uh, Here's in, closes my resume. If you need more information, by golly, I'll send it to you. No, I um, uh, uh, state that I'm responding to their ad from well, a certain date in a certain paper. Okay, and, uh, now there's news. We, we that, That's a waste of time. They know that. Okay. And I state uh, exactly why I think that I would be the person for the job. And I try to make it no more than a paragraph or two because I don't want to bore anyone. Mm-hmm. But how, um, do you, how do you know that you're the person for the job from, a, from an ad? Because many times the uh, description they give is similar to, to what I do or what I have done. Okay. Um, so a lot of similar duties or, the, or that my skills are very compatible. And I try to tell them in more broad, understandable terms, what kind of work I've done. Um, I try to leave out specialized kind of things that are peculiar only to my business, um, which wouldn't mean a lot to other people. Um, I specify that I've got computer skills, and I'm, okay. uh, for example, use Windows and Lotus and such, and as opposed to specialized software programs that we use that no one else would know anything about. Um, All this may or may not be pertinent, you see. Mm-hmm. And I don't know what would... See, I, I, I'm, at, I'm at a loss because I don't know what's going to impress me. I know when somebody applies to me, mm-hmm. I know what's going to impress me. Mm-hmm. There, are, there are little things that impress me, like somebody... Who they, they were, they'll get it in... The, you see, they if the guy's done their homework or the gal's done her homework, mm-hmm. she's going to know a little bit about me, isn't she? Right. And she's going to know that I'm going to be impressed if they tell me that they don't mind working Saturday nights and Sundays. Right. Well, I had uh, well, wait I did, well, that because that's my one of my hot buttons. Well, so, I did something uh, similar to what you're talking about. Uh, with uh, I went to great lengths. Uh, one job that I went after that was a uh, purchasing assistant. Um, I uh, looked up the company in um, one of the directories at the library. The Thomas Register. Out. Yeah, Thomas Register. I looked them up, found out uh, how many locations they had, what their uh, sales had been for the last year, some of their history and such. And uh, I had already sent um, the letter and resume as requested, and then I followed up with um, with a fax to their home office. Okay. And I said, you know, here's what I found out uh, on my own, not ever having heard of your company before. Well, I wouldn't and, say that. Uh, uh, I, don't, I don't want to be told that, well, you never heard of me before. Okay. <laughs> you just you okay. shot yourself right in the foot. Uh, okay, but I, I guess my point was that that's what I was able to find out about them in a very short period and that yeah, I could but that's, use that's, my resources. Oh, hold it, hold it, hold it, okay. hold it. Okay. You, see, if you, wait, um, you want me to criticize you or do you want me to just, uh, just stroke you? No, uh, yeah, I won't construct a All right, everything yeah. that you did, any, any, any idiot could do. Mm-hmm. Okay. Anybody can go to the library, anybody can, it's a start, all right? Mm-hmm. Okay. But that guy you wrote to, mm-hmm. how many kids do you have? Uh, I have no idea. Well, that's you ought to know. Okay. What are his likes and dislikes? Does he play golf? How long has he been with the company? Okay. Is he ready to retire? Or he's a new hire. Mm-hmm. All this information can be gathered, by the way, with a few astute phone calls. Okay. Who would I call for something Anybody like you can pump. Telephone operators. Be amazed how much they know. Mm-hmm. So you just call a telephone operator and... You start. call anybody... Oh, come on, guy. You got to be a little bit of a detective. Mm-hmm. Hey, listen. Uh, who's in charge of... The, you already know the question. Okay. Uh, hey, um, how long has he been with the company? I don't seem to remember... You understand what I'm getting at? Right. Play, you, you ever watch the Rockford Files? Sure, yeah. Well, you know how okay. Jim Rockford makes telephone calls with 14 different accents? Oh, yeah. It ain't hard to do. Yeah. Because if I can do it... Certainly, anybody else could do. Sure, okay. And you'd be surprised how much it gives you a leg up. Mm -hmm. Uh, You, you, you walk into to one of our businesses, and here's Steve Belly sitting there, and uh, Steve is hiring. Mm -hmm. Well, you want to know a little bit about him before you walk through the door. You want to know that he's worked for me since he was in his teens. Okay. Because that gives you a leg up, doesn't it? Yeah, sure. All right. You got to know that he has a couple of daughters, and so on and so forth. 
Okay. It doesn't require uh, Sherlock Holmes to find these things. And I'm not going to tell you you can find everything about everyone. Well, how do you work that into a letter when you're writing to someone? Because then he's, uh, I mean, I've, I've, a lot of people I know would say, well, you know, what you know about my personal life doesn't matter. It's what you, you know, uh, what, do you, what can you well, do? Well, and that, and that may be the case. Mm -hmm. That may be the case. But uh -huh. I'll tell you one thing. When I go into somebody, and I don't play golf. Mm -hmm. I used to play golf, all right? But you can bet your life in that firstborn kid of yours mm -hmm. that if I go in and I see a couple of golf trophies, yeah. suddenly I'm going to be talking about the new club and the grooves. And what do you think about that? That's all I got to do is open the door okay. and listen to him talk about it. I don't know what the hell he's talking about. Uh -huh. But I know I got his hot button okay. because golf is what he... Or if I see 14 United Way awards, mm -hmm. am I going to talk about that company? Right. Oh, no, I'm going <laughs> to talk about that... The United Way. Sure. I'm going to work it into the conversation and then shut up. Okay, I see. You know, feed, it, feed the ego a little. It's not, yeah, it's, you're, you're interested in what he's interested in. Mm hmm Okay. Not what you're, what you're interested in is of no moment. Who cares? Okay. It's what he is interested in. There's okay. a picture of him standing in front of his fighter from Korea or from mm -hmm. Vietnam or whatever it happens to be. Mm hmm Man, alive, if you aren't, if you aren't suddenly in a... Uh, uh, at least a little, you know about the EAA and Oshkosh, and you've been, please. Sure, okay. That's yeah. the kind of stuff that gets attention, my friend. Okay, that, that helps out it a lot. Sets you apart from mm -hmm. the 99,000 other guys. I was reading in, in a local paper today, there were like 800 applicants for, for uh, like four positions on a police department. Okay. Now, how, how did some guys make the cut? Well, they took tests. Okay. They took, they, 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 uh, took prep courses and whatever. If that's what it takes, that's what you got to do. You got to go the extra distance or you just, you're discarded. Good luck. I'm Bruce. This is TalkNet. Nampa, Idaho, welcome to my world. Bruce. Yes. I think. Let me, ch let me check. Uh, yep. It's me. How you doing? I'm, I'm, I had to look there in the mirror for a moment. I'm just fine. Thank you. Good. Look, I have a situation here that I need your opinion on. All righty. Okay. This, uh financial institute that I bank with. They tell me, according to their computers, at four different contact, I've contacted four different times today. And they tell me that I have an amount in it that is close to $11,000 more than what I'm supposed to have in it. Yeah. And they say it's mine. Yeah, that's terrific. Forget about it. Okay, let me ask you this. They're going to, because they're going to, they'll catch their error. Yeah, wait, go ahead. What's, what's up? If I touch, if I touch any of this money, what, what legal, what you, legal you, wrong am I doing? You can go to jail. How's that? I ain't no such thing should be. No, you, 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 you're a crook. Uh, no, I, I, I'm not going to say it's going to happen. Uh, there was a, the case here some years ago where, where it was the numbers were a little bigger. The guy went to Las Vegas and lost it all. Fortunately, for his point of view, he died, so they, that was the end of it. Mm -hmm. But no, they, 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 this is, you don't think this is unique. It happens regularly. Okay, well, like I said, I've contacted them four different yeah, I, I, times. All, hey, wait, 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 back up. You contacted them today. Right. Try them over a 60-day period and see what happens. Okay, so in other words, if it's still in there, if I no, don't it'll get 60 days. It's still not yours. Okay, but it'll, it'll get. It, but, well, I, but I've told them it's not mine. I'm trying to explain to you that. It, okay, I'm listening. Just, take a deep breath. You remember, how old are you? 39. All right. With you, there was a movie when you were a kid floating around. And I remember, I don't remember the characters, but it was back before computers. And I remember as a little child when my cousin worked in a bank, if the books didn't balance, nobody went home. Right. Well, if you think those days are still around. In this movie, uh, they were they were keeping everybody there. They knew there was an embezzler. And finally, the girl said, and two and two equals four. And she goes on the Eddie machine. It goes five. And that's where the money was, okay? Okay, well, let me ask you well, Hear me, listen to me. Okay, you, I'm hear me out. All right. In today's world, they can't keep people over time. Last year or the year before last, in one of our accounts, there was an extra 200 and some odd thousand dollars. Okay. And we had transferred it from one account to the other. I knew that. But they insisted at the end of the tax year, that's where the problem was because, you know, there was going to be some interest reported. And that was going to complicate things. 
And it took the bank something like 40 days to find that to work. Why that I kept explaining, I mean, didn't make a big issue out of it, but it sure as hell didn't go out and spend it either. Okay. But that 200 grand, I, the, the number might have been a little more than 200. But then you, you'd wonder now, how can they account, how do they balance their books? The answer is they don't. They do not. Okay. It'll turn up, might be two weeks, two months. Somebody obviously punched in a deposit or forgot to make a debit. The likelihood is that somebody punched in somebody else's deposit. Exactly. All right, but they'll pick it up. You think the other guy's going to sit there and play dead? Oh, no. When, he, when it doesn't show up in his account, he's going to be screaming like a bear with his tail in a trap. Exactly. But like oh. I said, when I, when I contacted them in person, I said, hey, look, there's a mistake. And they said, no, we don't make mistakes. <sighs> well, that's, that, that's a mistake in itself. But you're old enough to understand that they do make mistakes. And they'll pick it up, and you can't spend the money. Oh, I, I really didn't have the intention of doing it. I just want to know what, just what I could do from here. Do nothing. If you like, write them a note. Just write a note to the chief teller or to one of the officers of the bank. Okay. But they'll pick it up, trust me. Oh, I'm sure they will. All right, then they'll just get debited, and that'll be the end of it. Okay. Not a big deal. Okay. It's a big deal if you go out and spend it, though. Oh, I'm sure. When I was a kid, just, just when I was first married, the numbers weren't very big, but at that time, the numbers were very big to me. It was, you know, it was like $1,000. Boy, my eyes were as big as Orphan Annie's, you know? Mm hmm Oh, boy, oh, you know, my balance used to run $16.30, right? All of a sudden, I got a grand or something in the account. I mean, I was tempted, I must tell you. Oh, it's, it's very tempting. Well, I was tempted. with the holidays coming up. There you go. Well, this will be no holiday. You, you, you'll look great in stripes. <laughs> no, I don't. I wouldn't. <laughs> Good luck, kid. All right, thanks. All righty. And anybody at a bank who says we don't make mistakes just made a mistake with that stupid comment. Grand Rapids, hello there. Hello, Bruce. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Good. Good. I've heard you uh, tell people before that the biggest enemy to a small business is undercapitalization. That is certainly one of them. Well, I'm fighting that nasty animal right now bad. Okay. And I uh, need some help or some advice at least. I got a, my father started a portable toilet business. And uh, he's been running it for 32 years. And for 32 years, he's been undercapitalized. Huh. And uh, now he's 66. And uh, I'd like to take it over from him. But... uh that's to me that's the biggest <clears throat> biggest problem we got you know well, I mean, if you've been around 32 years he must have figured a way around it it's been through sheer hard work and frustration well i mean after 32 years why has he kept it as he continued to expand <sighs> no well he he did really good i mean from where he started to where he is now he's expanded you know 100 fold but uh for the past Five, six, seven, maybe ten years, it's been just stagnant. How many units do you have? Uh, about 300. And are, are they working usually? Uh, during the summer, we'll have over 200 of them out. You know, two, even 250. And then uh, we drop off in the wintertime up here in Michigan. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and, you know, like I say, it's, uh, we've been around, and well, I don't think we'll ever go out of business, but I'm just kind of tired of banging my head against the wall, trying to be the jack of all trades, doing, you know, doing this, doing that, not having the money to pay somebody else to do it. Or well, it, it sounds to me like that, that you're not doing enough business or you're not, and you're not charging enough for your product. Well, the charging for the product problem is that no matter what, we always end up getting somebody is going to come in and going to do it cheaper. Mm -hmm. And these guys, I've per, I'm only 28, and I've only been doing it full time since I got out of college five years ago. Mm -hmm. And in that time, there's been three companies come and go. Yeah. But they continually, Be they come in. Oh, sure. It. Happens all the time. And then the problem is that, that, that neophytes get involved in enterprises, and they think they can do it for so much. I, well, those guys are charging too much. I can do it for less than the first thing. You know, they go belly up. No question. There's there's a limit. So there's a there's a price on every business that you can't go below and stay solvent. Yeah. And but oftentimes amateurs come in and they figure, oh, I can do it for a lot less, and they can't. <laughs> but on the other hand, the airlines are a perfect example of that, right? 
Uh-huh. I mean, they, they, you'll see sales. They can't possibly send somebody close to coast for $99. Can't do it. <laughs> but if the competition does it, they got to do it, too. And that's what our problems, man. And we've had to keep our prices. I mean, we've been stuck literally and figuratively in the 50s, mm-hmm. you know. And uh, I just, I don't know if I, I'm afraid to. I, I really believe I could generate a lot more business, but I'm afraid that we wouldn't be able to handle it because well, we don't have the... Uh, you don't have the capital. We don't have the equipment mm-hmm. or the capital to maintain or, or upgrade our equipment in order to handle any more business. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm working... 50, 60 hours a week, every week. Well, I don't have any problem with that. Well, I understand but, that, but... Uh, but, but, if you, but if you can't make money at it, maybe you want to go into some other business. Well, I know, but what am I going to do with my folks? Well, I don't know. I'm that. not worried about myself. I, I'm young. I'm the old the toilet business has put me through college. There's plenty of things I can do. Well, your father is not exactly an old geezer. Well, I know, but he's pretty much kept all his eggs in one basket, and that's riding on that business. Well, what, is there some reason why you're going to be there? Only because if I quit tomorrow, he'd be SOL. Why? Because, uh, well, he couldn't get somebody to do all that I do for the amount of money he pays me. Mm-hmm. Well, how did he do it before you got there? Well, he did it with my older brother for a while, and then uh, I'm the youngest of six kids, and everyone else turned their nose up. <laughs> but, he, but he got in, huh? Everybody else turned their nose up, and I'm the last one left, and I hated to see his 30 years of, you know, life work go down the tubes off or nothing. Well, the, the, the problem is, but it, it's, how much could you sell that business for right now? Well, that's, <laughs> that's why I'm calling you, because we were trying to do that. Mm. And well, uh, we uh, had an offer, and, well, we're going to call them back now, because... What was uh, the offer? The offer was 140000 and uh, at the time, I didn't even realize we got that offer because my dad didn't tell me because he thought I really wanted it. Mm-hmm. He thought he'd be, you know, cutting my throat. Well, it was nice of your father. It, yeah, mm-hmm. <laughs> it was, but... Uh, but you weren't communicating and that wasn't too good. That was not good, no. And uh, What does so, the business throw away? How much does your dad take out of the business a year? How much does he take out? Yeah. I really couldn't say. I don't know. Well, it's pretty hard to fix a value. Because value is essentially derived of of, of uh, earnings. I mean, his value. I mean, what it'd be. What no, in other words, the value of the business is established by what it what it earns. And if you don't know what it earns, it's pretty hard to sit here and, and talk well, I about. Know, I know it grosses well, roughly gro- 125 grand a year. Well, gross doesn't tell us very much. Right, but the way we operate, uh, there's very very low overhead. Mm-hmm. I mean, all everything's paid for. I mean, we don't have hardly. I think he's he's got less than twenty thousand dollars in outstanding debt. Mm-hmm. That's payment on a truck that we just bought last year. I mean, one hundred twenty grand is pretty low gross. Well, yeah, I understand. Well, that. then maybe that, that the other guy was. Where was it, it? Was that a cash offer you had? I don't know. I would have to well. talk to him again. I just wanted to. If I were you, it sounds to me, young fellow, that maybe you're in a business that uh, needs it, to be needs to be retired. Oh, well, but there's a definite need for. It. I mean, we've he's he's has lived off it for 32 years. I'm aware years of that, but you're telling me 120 grand, gross. Sure. With with two or three people working, it's just not there. There's no money there. But if we had all the business in the area, there would be. But what makes you think they're ever going to have all the business in the area? Well, I don't know, and there's other companies in Chicago and Milwaukee that have done it. Well, maybe I so. Mean, maybe so, son. I mean, it just seems to me that there's some businesses that just outlive themselves, and they need a decent burial. <laughs> I do wish you well, kid. Thank you. So I know the, I know the, I know your frustration, but I just don't see where there's a great solution for it. I'm Bruce Williams. This is TalkNet. We go now to, <coughs> excuse me, New Bedford, Mass. Hello there. Hello. I hope you are patient with me. I am a little nervous. All right. How are things down east? Um, not too bad, but the weather is pretty good. Um, I have a problem. I went to New York last week, and I bought some jewelry for a friend, which she already has paid me. Mm-hmm. But she checked it out. It's supposed to be a 14 carat. It's only 10. Uh, with 10 carats, so I bought it too, it's too expensive. And now I feel guilty about it. 
Where'd you buy this stuff on 47th Street? Uh, 42nd. 42nd Street? Yeah, there was a jewelry there. Uh, it's not really a jewelry. It's um, uh, maybe it was 47. You can see, all right? Yeah. 47th between 5th and 6th is the jewelry district. Is that where you went? Uh, yeah. Uh, it was inside of another store. It was like a stand. Yeah, they have little booths, you mean. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. That sounds like 47th Street. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And now I'm stuck. Yeah, uh, that's about the size of it. I feel guilty that <laughs> uh, I bought that because it, right now she's not too happy about it. Uh, it wasn't my taste, so I don't like what I bought because I was for her. Well, and wait a minute, wait a minute. You're, you were doing her a favor. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, you're not a jeweler. You're not an expert. She took a shot and she lost. <laughs> I don't think you have anything to feel guilty about. I know. But I wish I had done a better job. <laughs> well, that's fine. But you wander around 47th Street, unless you know what you're up to, I mean, they can have your pants off. You never know your belt's undone. <laughs> Isn't that true? I guess. But the, you uh, guess. <laughs> what about if I go back? I was thinking, if I go back. How much did you pay for this stuff? Uh, it was only $150. But even so, I feel like, uh, in other words, they took advantage of me. Oh, of course. I bought a 14 carat, not a 10 carat. Is it marked 14? Uh, according to them, it's Italian. Italians don't mark uh, the carats. What is this, chain? Yeah, it's a bracelet, and it was a, a charm. Hmm. And how did she determine it was 10 carat, not 14? Uh, she took to a jeweler, hmm. which they said, she said that they, they look into it. So I'm I sorry, the, the jeweler said what? Uh, in other words, they're looking to it to see if it was a first year. Well, thing. they may or may not. I don't know how you just look at something and tell. I don't know either. Uh, uh, in other words, they took overnight to, to check that out. Mm -hmm. Well, for 150 bucks, we heard I wouldn't worry about it. Really? No, ma'am. I know, but, uh, you know, when people work too hard... It's little... That isn't the issue. The issue yeah. is you didn't know what you were buying. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're, you're buying, the, you, when you deal on the street there, and I buy stuff over there, mm -hmm. unless you know who you're dealing with, you're open to getting taken. Mm -hmm. Simple as that. Well, I try my best to be a lower price. But... Well, that's fine. <laughs> Good luck, sweetheart. Okay, thank I you. I wouldn't worry about it. And going back to those guys frequently is a waste of time, too. Uh, they either aren't there, or they don't know you, or whatever. St. Cloud, Minnesota, hello. Hello? Yes. Let's get it on, guy. Yeah, uh, I uh, own an auto repair shop. All right, take it easy now. You're stuttering. Say it again. I'm an owner of an auto repair shop. Okay. Uh, customer called me today. You know, I did some work on their car like oh, a month ago. And they, uh, she wanted me to write out a thing saying that uh, her car was in a front-end collision. So, um, <laughs> I, I did some work on it, and I was just, you know. Well, well, let's, let's, let's back up a little bit. What Very easy question. Was the car in a front-end collision? Yeah, when I was working on it, yeah. I, I noticed, you know, probably the front, you know, I had the battery out. And well, let, let's do it this way. No, wait a minute. No, hold it. Take a deep breath. Was the car in, in, in your place as a result of a collision, or did you, you mean that you saw evidence of, Previous damage. Yeah, evidence of previous damage. All right, and she wants you now to re to to testify to that because yeah. she probably didn't know about it. What did you bring it to her attention? Yeah, just small talk. You know, I told her, yeah, our grill, you know, is put in crooked a little bit. Mm -hmm. She says, well, they never knew it was in a, you know. Okay, so now she wants you to she wants to go back to the the place where she acquired the car. Is that it? Correct. All right. So what are you asking me? Um. Uh, do I write something for her? Well, uh, do I want her as a customer or the dealership, you know, that she's taking the course? Uh, no, I, I can't tell you that. I mean, if you want to help her, uh, it's fine. If you don't, that's okay, too. You gave an opinion. You're not, re if she you're not required to, to put it in writing. No. But you've got to decide whether you want to keep her as a customer. you got you got to handle on it. And if you refuse, you can bet your life you'll never see her again, and she'll spend the rest of her life bad mouthing you. No. Good luck, guy. Okay. I'm Bruce Williams. This is TalkNet. Hello there, Rochester. Welcome to TalkNet. Well, thanks, Bruce. I'm glad to get on. Me Long too. Long time listener. Good. What's on your mind? Time caller. I'm holding a mortgage. Uh, I 
uh, sold some property in uh, January of 1993. Mm-hmm. And the payments were always about, about a week to uh, three weeks late. Mm-hmm. And now this last time, uh, the check came back bounced. Mm-hmm. It was due in October, the end of October. The check came through uh, 16th of November. And I got it back today from the bank. Mm-hmm. And with a with the charges on it. Mm-hmm. Now this is I held the mortgage because it was uh, problems financing the property because of what it consisted of. It was old farmland and like that, and they wouldn't the banks wouldn't write a mortgage on it. Mm-hmm. This has all gone through a lawyer, so I don't have the agreement here. It's not it's uh, in a safe deposit box. Mm-hmm. But I wonder, basically, what are my options? With Your option is to put up with it, try to get the money, or foreclose. And, it, and I will tell you, if you wanted to make the sale, you, otherwise you wouldn't have done this. Mm-hmm. You're going to try to, to work things out first before you foreclose. Oh, yeah, right. Well, that's, well those are your options. Mm-hmm. They're pure and simple. Either you, you work it out or foreclose. Well, foreclosure, what would that involve? You'd have to force a sale of the property, would you? Well, it, it's yeah, you force it through, a, through the sheriff, not through... Uh, you can't force them to sell. Right, I see. Now, I get yeah, you, you, you take the... It's, well, it's not real complicated. But I mean, this is an oversimplification. Right. You start what is called a foreclosure proceeding. You go through the... The, the property will be literally seized and sold. You... How much, how much is owed on the property right now? How much is owed? Yeah. Uh, the last payment... About. Let's see. Oh, uh... Thirty-five thousand, right. thirty-six thousand. How much is the property worth right now? Mm, probably around hundred. All right, then you'd go in and bid thirty-five. Right. If somebody else bids out, bids you, you get your money. Well, there's two mortgages. My brother holds one too. Well, you know. First. What I'm trying to get to is the first mortgage holder generally bids the amount that is owed to him. Right. We'd have to do it together. Then. Yeah. Then let, let the let the vultures fight over that. How about selling the mortgage? At this point, a mortgage in default, you'll take a hell of a beating. You'll, there'll be a big discount. I'm Bruce Williams. This is Talk Night. Let's go up to Hartford, Connecticut and see what's happening. Hello there. Hi, Mr. Williams. How are you? I'm just fine, thank you. Uh, well, I got a problem. And... I would kind of figured that, otherwise we wouldn't be talking, huh? Right, right. Okay, um, I'm 22 years old. I'm just out of college and mm-hmm. I'm in grad school. What are you, what are you studying? Uh, computer science. Okay. And, um, as you might imagine, you know, money's kind of short. What and, a surprise that is. Yeah. Um, I'm living, I'm living in a, a kind of three-bedroom apartment here. Mm-hmm. And so I've got two roommates, obviously. Uh, one of whom just left, owing about $600 in phone bills, um, and about 200 more in unpaid utilities and in, rent. In whose name were the utilities? Uh, mine. Well, you're stuck. Um, I was talking to some other people who suggested small claims court. Well, wait a while. Let's separate things a little bit. I didn't mean that you don't have a claim against him. Oh, I, I mean, I've paid everything. Oh, you have? But, okay. I mean, I was using next semester's school money. <laughs> oh, lovely. Yeah. Well, let's let's start with a... This, this was your roomie. What, is this a good friend? No, obviously, well, no longer. Uh, yeah, no longer, but I, I always thought, you know, uh, we were you, pretty good friends. I mean... You, you thought he was honorable. Uh, Did he stick you because he wanted to stick you? Did he stick you because he didn't have any money or what? I think it was a little little bit of both. Um, A, it was a she. Um, Okay. Was this more than a roommate? Was this a... No, no. This was... was Strictly a a threes threes company kind of deal, not a... I'm Jack Tripper. Um, Okay. (laughs) uh, So, it's, you know, it's a little bit of both. She's certainly not the most responsible girl I've ever met in my life. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, I have a third roommate who did not get along with her well at all. I mean, the two of them were always at each other's throats. What I'm trying to get to is, let's assume that, that you could you could go to small claims court. Right. And let's further assume that you were successful. That's the easy part. Is it, I mean, am I worried about the friendship? No, I'm not worried oh. about that. I'm worried about collecting. You see, yeah, if, she, you know, if she hasn't got anything... Uh, a, a judgment is just an empty piece of paper, or and, and even more. Well, let me extend that. If she hasn't got something you can get to, right? It's an empty piece of paper. Well, Unless, of course, she just decided to write a check. Yeah, I'm. You know, I'm. I'm not sure. I don't. I mean, she's she's a waitress, but she was definitely making enough that. I mean, this happened. She made the phone calls at the end of October, mm-hmm. and I know she could have paid the phone bill off by then. You know, how much was the, how much was the phone bill? Uh. 
Actually, the total phone bill was like $650. Who in the world was she calling? Uh, she was calling California. She, I mean, I'm not really sure why. I have a couple ideas. Give me an idea or two for 600 bucks for a college kid. She was, she was pregnant and looking for the father. Well, well that'll do it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway, so. Well, that's the, well, you see, all these things, that's an important variable. Is she still pregnant? Um, you know, like I said, I was pretty good friends with her. I drove her to the hospital, you know, mm -hmm. two times a week. I mean, does she now have an offspring? What's that? Does she now have a child? Well, she already had two. I, I'm pretty sure she had an abortion. But, uh -huh. I, you know, again, I don't know. Well, you think, see, these are other variables. If she had two children, I mean, she's supporting two children. Let's put it that way. No, no, no. There was her ex-husband. Oh, like okay. I said, I mean... She, I'm looking at her financial responsibilities is what I'm trying to get to you. So. Um, she, she, uh, almost... She just spent, she almost spent a week in California. She went because, or she didn't go because the person who she uh, who she was going to stay with, she kind of had a fight with. But she had enough money to buy a plane ticket to California. All right. So then the, the chances are she has some money. She yeah, she has some money, and you, I know the father's bankrolled her. Have you gone to talk to her? How old a woman is this? Twenty five. Right. Have you gone to talk to her about it? Um, no. It's you know it's it's really weird when her and my other roommates started fighting. She, I did not see her for, you know, for three weeks. She just locked herself in a room and stayed there. Mm -hmm. And I would ask her about it occasionally. And, you know, she'd say, oh, I'll give you money at the end of the week. You know, sometimes mm -hmm. she did. Checks she, in the mail kind of thing, yeah. She paid 50 bucks on it so far since right. October. Well, um, you'd, you'd probably be better off to try to work something out with her on a payment schedule. But here's what I'm saying. She's always telling me that. She's, she's, not, she's not responsible enough to stick to a payment schedule. And on the day she moved her stuff out of here, she, I wasn't here, but my other roommate was. And they got in a big fight. And he you know, pretty much chucked most of her stuff over the balcony. Oh, and, and she said she wasn't going to pay. I don't, she, she never left me a number or a forwarding address where she well, would be. Oh, here's the, what's your first name? My name is Kevin. Kevin, there's nothing to prevent you from going to small claims court. Okay. And it's, and it's not a costly process. I mean, 15, it's 30 20. bucks, I call it okay. today. Okay, so it's not a costly okay. process. And there's a very strong likelihood that if you did go to small claims court, she won't even respond. Right. So you'll, you'll get what is called a default judgment. Right, I've been, I've been told about that. Actually. But the problem there is then, Kevin, what do you do with it? I was told... Um, I, I called I called a, a guy I know who's a lawyer who told me that in the case of a default judgment, the judge would make up a payment schedule. Yeah, but that's what you see, we're back to the same thing, Kevin. Well, if she hasn't got the money, so she's in contempt, so what? Well, I mean, a judge is... Uh, Doesn't matter, Kevin. It's got to be a lot more binding than mine. Kevin, let's get real. Do you know, the, the statistically, and I, and I can't defend this number, but I believe it's a good one, 70% of all small claims judgments are not collected. Not collected. Wow. I mean, you know, I mean, on the one hand, that's my school money, and you know, I would really do anything. I mean, you know, I'm not getting any money now. That's for sure. You know. Well, then, or then, then let's put it this way: you have little to lose. I have, I've, I've nothing to lose except for well, 30, thirty bucks. <laughs> yeah, but you know, thirty bucks. If I'm short for grad school, it's not going to be by thirty bucks. I understand that. You then know? you have nothing to lose, and, and as far as the friendship is concerned. That I, you know, who not cares? Much salvage, I guess. With friends like this, you don't need any enemies. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Um, my, you know, the second part of my question though is, is how would I go about kind of presenting my case in small claims court? Well, pretty everything. simple. It's pretty simple, Kevin. You had a roommate, right? The bills were in my name. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm the judge now. You're talking to me, okay. right? Or I'm you talking to the judge. I don't know if this makes any difference, but there's no lease. There was never any. Sign. It has nothing to do with anything. anything. Okay. You bring your other roommate in to testify. Yes, Mary Jane Jones was a, one of one of our. You know, we were sharing quarters and so on and so forth from, -doop -doop -doop, from whatever the dates were. Uh, during that time, the utilities were in my name. Yeah, and Mary Jane did have permission to use the telephone. However, the agreement was that uh, each of us paid our own uh, toll calls and we contributed uh, not uniformly but equally for the utility bills and so on and so forth, the heat and the rest of that stuff, right? Right. Uh, when she moved out, this is my accounting, these are the bills, you have them with you, and this is her share, which she failed to pay. That's it. Okay, so... You don't have to have a lease, you don't have... You know, the, well, first of all, you could probably prove that she lived there. Yeah. Uh, I would think. Yeah, she got um, mail here and stuff. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. That sort of thing. 
and you're going to have your 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 uh, roommate testify only to the fact that she lived there, that you have a had an agreement among you to distribute the expenses in the, the, the whatever fashion you did. That's it. Don't get involved in chucking the stuff over the balcony and the rest of that. She may, but it seems to me that's extraneous. Yeah, right. I mean. I mean, you know, because when, when she didn't pay, me and the other roommate didn't split it. I mean, I paid it myself. Why didn't he help, help a little bit? Well, I mean, he's just as bad off financially as she is. Well, that now. may be. But that, it seems to me that, well, that's another problem. I mean, he should have, but, you know, when the money's due, it's due. And if he doesn't have it, I know. Okay, I, see, I you met your responsibilities honorably, and I can't hate you for that. Yeah, I, I know. Uh, he's, I can't help it, you know. Be a little dumb. I was listening to you uh, yesterday or two days ago, and you were saying how I can't remember the story, but something happened, and you were out a thousand dollars. This is when you were close to my age, and you thought it was a pretty big deal. <laughs> it was a big deal, <laughs> but uh, you know, like looking back on it, you kind of yeah, got... you look foolish, and like a lot of things, my friend, when they're happening, they're very serious. Uh, a quarter of a century later, you get a chuckle or two. I do wish you well, my friend. I am Bruce Williams. This is talk best. Let's try Vestal, New York, and see what's happening. Hello. Hello there. Hello, Bruce. It uh, is I. This is Jim. Yes, I uh, <clears throat> just wanted to uh, uh, compliment you on uh, your past radio shows. My wife and I li listen to them quite a bit. Well, I'm delighted, you. But my problem here now, it's not a real serious problem, but we have something coming up, hopefully, now. Uh, we have uh, a possibility... Uh, financially, to be able to go to Alaska. Boy, it's a, you mean to live or to just to visit? No, no, just to visit. Just yes. to visit. But probably the only uh, visit we'll ever make to Alaska. Well, I got to tell you something. It's a, it's an experience that you owe yourself. It is a delightful, delightful place, and the people are as friendly as anywhere you will ever go. That's great. Now, the the main question I have is when would be the best time to go to Alaska? How do you spell summer? <laughs> Not a winner, then, anyhow, right? <laughs> As you know, I was ch chatting with uh, uh, a gentleman I, I, I know reasonably well, uh, not not a, not a close confidant, but he called me the other night. Mm -hmm. 35 below. That was in the oh, North Pole, Alaska. Hello! I've been in North Pole, but I don't go there in the wintertime. 35 <laughs> below. I mean, they're not this year. You know, you, the people who know me well would, would get a chuckle out of that, you see. <laughs> now, having said that, uh, how long do you have and what kind of well, a budget are we talking about? I, well, uh, I can raise enough for, for a, a, a cruise and a tour, probably. All right. There's nothing wrong with that. And the, uh, uh, you're talking I, about a cruise probably out of Vancouver. Uh, and it takes you up to, uh, and I can't think of the name of the town, but it's it's right below Anchorage. And then you take a bus up Sitka to Anchorage. Sitka, maybe, or... No, it's not Sitka. Uh, Ketchikan, I've heard of it. Well, no, not Ketchikan either. Um, that doesn't really matter. They, they, they say in the literature uh, Anchorage, but it is not Anchorage. It's about 120 miles below Anchorage. Oh, really? Yeah, oh, yeah. Okay. You hop on, uh, and I, I've been, I, I flew out of there last time I was there. I see. But without regard to that, how much... You had, you, first of all, you said you're retired, right? Yes. So I, well, time I is not. Say, but, I, but I'm retired. My wife and I will probably won't uh, ever do it again. Well, but, but my uh, point, that I'm trying to get to, is time is not a major factor there. Mm, shouldn't be no. Well, what? Neither it is or it's not. Well, uh, what I'm trying to get to. Can you take three it, weeks a month? Oh yes, I, I'm sure. Well, that's what. Well, see, I, if I were doing this, I wouldn't do it totally with with a structured tour. I see. Is what I'm trying to get to. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, and if, I, I take it that you have enough money where you don't have to, to watch every penny and backpack and that oh, kind sure. of stuff. Yeah. Okay, fine. And you can take uh, the cruise either up or back. My inclination would be to take it back. I see. Uh, the reason for that is this way you're nice and fresh and ready to, to rot and kick butt. And then you have a, oh, yeah, serious, then you have a week to kind of relax and wind down when you get back to Vancouver. I see. Now that, that there's there's nothing there's no really any great difference in the in the cruise up or down so you go to the same place Glacier Bay the inside passage and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. I would do it in July. July is the best. Oh, it gets cold in August. Uh, yeah, that's it, what I was thinking too. It's drafty. July is a good month, and you realize the days are going to be something on the order of 19, 20 hours long, which is delightful. 
Wow. You sit around a bit. I mean, I've been up there in Fairbanks and, and sitting around an outdoor restaurant at 1230 watching people water skate. That's 1230 a.m. 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 At midnight? In natural life. That's right. Now, I'll be if, done. I, if it were me, I would arrange to fly up to Anchorage. Okay. Is, that's a good gateway, and that's where you're going to take the... Uh, and your travel agent should be able to work this out with the with the cruise line, too. Okay. Where you go up two or three weeks early. Okay. And there is a great deal to see in and around Anchorage. And you, Anchorage and you, first, then. Well, it doesn't really matter. I'd start out there, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I would rent a car, definitely. Okay. And the one thing that you're gonna, you should do is sit down and uh, work out your itinerary because the one thing that is in short supply in the summer is hotel accommodations. Oh, I see. They are not real easy to find if you don't have reservations. Not impossible, but a little difficult. I see. And if you're not real fussy, that's not a factor. Okay. Okay, so I'd, I'd spend some time in Anchorage, uh, in probably 60, 70 miles south of Anchorage. You drive down along the water, and you can see the beluga whales and the killers, and, and maybe if you get real lucky, a, a couple of doll sheep, and uh, I've forgotten the name of the, the glacier. You can go down to the national park. and I see. It's, uh -huh. it's, all, it's just a nice area to go pop around, okay? Great. Then I would drive over to Valdez. Okay. And uh, there is a ferry boat that you can take, which I think you might enjoy. As part of the way on the road, or you can drive all the way, your choice. Little around the horn if you drive. Mm -hmm. Go to Valdez. You certainly want to take a, 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 a isn't it King William, King Prince William, William Sound? William Sound. Mm -hmm. You want to take you, you want to take the day trip out on the on the on the day boat. You go out and have uh, lunch on one of these little islands, and it's quite an adventure. Mm -hmm. And even at that time of the year, you're going to see ice floating around mm -hmm. in the water, which is disquieting from where I'm sitting. <laughs> Uh, yeah. But you, but but well, it's, it's here too in the wintertime. Well, but this is July, man. <laughs> right, that's right. Uh, okay, then you want to drive from Valdez up to Fairbanks. Now that's about three and a half hundred miles. Pretty good ride. And if memory serves me, there's one gas station. I would suggest that you stop. Small car too. <laughs> well, they, they, but they, no, you don't get a small car. You get a, and, and frequently that you're going to make certain you have enough fuel on board. All right. Okay. It's, it's a long hike. I'm very serious when I tell you. I think there's one gas station in between. Oh. And it's a little, you know, luncheonette and that kind of curio shop and whatever. And there may be more since I, I did that about three years ago. But I can't imagine why. I don't see a need for it. Mm -hmm. uh, the only caveat in the driving is you got to be a little cautious. And remember that if the permafrost has affected the roadway, you can all of a sudden be in, on, a, on a gravel road that's a paved road that becomes gravel and you can go into a spin. No, I'm serious. It's no big deal. You just be aware of it. That's all. I'll be darned. But you, uh, you can stop at a glacier, and and uh, there's a, and the flora and fauna and the natural life will be. I think you'll be agreeably uh, surprised. You start out early in the morning. It's no big deal. I, I drove it pretty rapidly, but that's another program. But you're talking about the trip from, from Valdez, from Valdez area to, to Fairbanks. Fairbanks, and. There's very little in between except one gas station, probably no restaurants, no place to one. Well, that's the hide. place to eat. That's the only place. <laughs> My gosh! But it's a it's a lovely drive. It really is. You'll you'll enjoy that. Sounds good. Fairbanks itself is, I guess, my favorite place in Alaska. Okay, uh, there is good. so much to do there. You want to get out and see Gold Dredge Number Eight. Uh, with Big John, you want to see the uh, El Dorado Mine, uh, you want to go on the Riverboat Discovery, mm -hmm. uh, the Red Dog Saloon is out, I think it's, no, the Red Dog is in Juneau, uh, or maybe it's not, is the Red Dog in Juneau, I forget, there's a, there's a, there's a uh, country western joint out of town that uh, all the politicians hang out and has all the, the charm of my basement after a rainstorm, but everybody goes there. <laughs> Everybody goes there. And then there's another place, and I and I, I apologize not knowing the name, but the locals will tell you it's about 27, 28 miles out of town. And you go out there, and this building is lit up all year round with Christmas lights. And it, 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 it's uh, largely locals go there. And uh, you, you, oh, yes, you want to go to Alaska land in, in uh, uh, Fairbanks. Okay. And uh, the Malumut, Malumut Saloon. And you definitely want to have some Robert Service poetry. You want to hear some Robert Service. That is outstanding. Really? And it, I'm dying. And you can hear that at the Malamute, and you can hear that at the Alaska Land. In Alaska Land, there are a couple, three buffets. The one that, it, at the, th there's a, a tavern a lot, that, that has, in my opinion, the better one. Um, you know, ribs and fish and all that kind of good stuff. Mm -hmm. And you'll, you'll enjoy that all you can pack in. It's a little crude, but that's the way it's supposed to be. Oh, well, sure. 
they try to i understand they try to uh, uh adapt their living today as it was back in the days of the gold rush and only well, advertising um, that is yeah that but, I'm, but i but i but i that's a little overdone <laughs> I, yeah well i imagine it is sure. uh they still got a microwave you know uh you <laughs> yeah, can fine. you you either if you if you wish you can take a, a tour by air up to a place called Anatuvik. That's this is not inexpensive. It probably costs you several hundred bucks for the day, mm-hmm. but it is a it is the northernmost Eskimo village in Alaska. It's way up there on the Yukon River, wow. and it's 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 not a place I want to stay. Let me tell you, the mosquitoes are the size of B twenty nines, and they have no running water. And it's but it's a, certainly a worth a visit. Mm-hmm. I, I when I was when I went up there about a year ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I, the pilot got into the plane. I'm looking around for a co-pilot. There isn't any. So guess who? I said to him, you know, I got news for you. Uh, you got a co-pilot now. I maybe not the greatest pilot in the world, but I can drive this thing. You know. <laughs> so we're up there. We're talking, and, and he said, "Do you know who I am?" And I said, "Well, I hope to heaven that you're the pilot. You know, you got four stripes on your shoulders." <laughs> and he said, "Yeah, but I only do this part time. Hmm. <laughs> part time. That's nice. Uh, about one week a month I fly. What do you do the rest of the time?" I'm a Jesuit priest. Is that right? That's the truth. He said he had a 180 tail dragger and he visits his flock. Well, he had 10,000 hours in Alaska. Guy was a hell of a pilot, let me tell you. I think I I had both ends covered there, you know, at the top and the bottom covered. (laughs) Uh, Anatubic is north of the Arctic Circle, and there are relatively few of us who have been north of the circle. And then there's a a service road that goes up to um, uh, Prudhoe Bay. And they have bus tours that will take you above. You're not allowed to drive up there without permits. I see. But you can go up on a bus tour so you can say you've been above the Arctic Circle, which is kind of fun. But is that kind of, is that worth the effort to go up to Prudhoe, would you say? You, you can't go to Prudhoe. Well, I mean, even if you went to under, you know. Oh, if you can get into Prudhoe, let me tell you, it, it, yes, it's worth the price the whole trip. But you're not going to get in there. Yeah, you, you had, it takes an act of God to get you in there. I was very fortunate the governor invited me, and I took a tour of Prudhoe. Is but you, right? you can get as far as Dead Horse, which is a city outside of Prudhoe, but you can't get onto the oil installation without knowing a lot of people, I can tell you. Well, that. I would expect it's uh, a little dangerous. Anyhow, you, well, not dangerous. They, you, just well, gotta have juice to, you just got to have juice to get in there, that's all. Okay. So if you can work that out, by all means do it. But I think you'll find that's a little tough unless you know somebody with one of the oil companies. I see. So I, I just got done doing a hell of a tour of Alaska, as you can get from the tone well, of my I, voice. I get the impression that you enjoyed yourself. I Well, I've been there many times. Uh-huh. And I this is the first summer that I haven't gone back in years, and I'm hopeful I'll go back next year. I see. Yeah, I think I'll add, Oh, yeah, you want to get to the North Pole, by the way. Well, North Pole, I North, to hold it. North Pole, Alaska, I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. They have a big store there with Christmas stuff and whatever, and uh, they're very friendly. It's just another place to go, that's all. Mm-hmm. So now I'll give you your tour of Alaska guy. i got to turn you loose. Okay, well, I sure appreciate it. I certainly hope you enjoy yourself. I feel that Americans that go to Europe and the Far East before they hit Alaska are making a major mistake. It is certainly our, our really our last frontier area. The people are genuinely warm and friendly, and the scenery is absolutely magnificent. The winters are too damn cold. I'm Bruce Wiggins. This is Talk Net. Warren, Ohio, hello there. Hello, Bruce. Hello, Bruce. Yes, sir. Well, it's a pleasure to talk to you. We've well, listened to you for years on the radio and uh, decided to give you a little call. Well, I'm delighted you're here, Tiger. What's on your mind? Well, uh... Well, just a little rundown. Uh, I'm 66, my wife's 72, Ooh, and we're retired. An older lady. Go ahead. And we both think we're 39. No, I can believe it. <laughs> we're, uh, we've are we been staying down in Florida on a little island called Pine Island, which is close to Sanibel, not too far from Fort Myers. Mm-hmm. And uh, we're thinking about buying a place down there. All right. It's, uh, I would call it a mobile home park down there, but they get mad when you call them that. I yes, they, they do. They call them pre-manufactured manufactured yeah, homes. Yeah, manufactured whatever. homes. They but they're still mobile. They, a lot of them are double-wide mobile homes. No right. question about that. And it's a it's a beautiful little park. It's it's really nice. Everybody in it's nice. Uh, very clean. Uh, and uh, we've decided we'd like to sell here in Ohio and mm-hmm. buy down there. Right. And some of them places are sold through the owner, and some of them are sold through realtors. Mm-hmm. And we probably will only have 
Well, whatever we get out of our home here when we put it up for sale mm -hmm. will be our down payment. They say there's no problem borrowing well, money. Well, let's, let's stop right now. How much money do you think you'll get out of your house in Ohio? I would say probably close to 40. Well, you should be able to buy a place for not much more than that. Then, how much do they want for these things? Well, they're they're running between fifty-five and sixty. Okay, so because they have a, a beautiful big swimming pool and a hot tub, which we spend two or three hours a day in. Probably. Okay, well, what I want you to do is 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 take a look at the the buy owner because there's a great deal of property turns over in Florida because of the death of the owners, very candidly. Right. And there are bargains. I would not try to buy it from here. Get down there and rent and start looking. Well, that's what we intend on doing. Okay. Uh, if you buy off a, an owner, would you would be wise to have an attorney handle it. Oh, please. Right. Now, what if you buy off a realtor? Same thing. Same thing. Absolutely. Okay. I was kind of curious about that. I thought maybe you would have bought through a realtor that it would know what they're doing. And that may or may not property. be. They, they may know what they're doing and they may not. Mm -hmm. The fact is that you want somebody who is only dedicated to your welfare, and that's your attorney. Mm -hmm. That takes nothing away from the real estate guy. Mm -hmm. His job is to bring a buyer and a seller together. Your job is to protect yourself. Do you think we're foolish in making a move like this? Well, I did. <laughs> well, we're both very happy when we're down there and we enjoy it. Well, then what? What's more to be said? Right. I mean, what well, makes what makes you know? There's nothing wrong with Ohio. Yeah, this the thing is, they're going into debt again. You know, when you own a home and then it's well, the first thing. Is, first of all, you don't necessarily have to to buy there. Uh, you could probably buy a little for a little less money, but what difference? Is it? Well, let's talk about this. What what is the source of your income? Uh, just our Social Security, and I have a couple uh, pension plans coming in. All right. So, how much do you have coming in a month? Oh, well, probably around oh, a month. Yeah. Um, about, about two thousand. Well, you could live very comfortably. I wouldn't worry about it. That's least. what we figured. We said, you know, the heck on it. I mean, you know. Well, go for it. <laughs> okay, and. I uh, you can foresee no other big problems in the, in the buying except make sure we get an attorney, right? And be, and be certain that you can get insurance because the, the, the mobile homes are a little difficult to insure because they don't weather too well when it comes to hurricanes. But aside from that, no. I'd say, listen, you're never going to be 65 again. It's a lovely part of the world where you are now served its purpose and it treated you well. But there's no reason to believe it shouldn't be someplace else in another part of your life. I'm Bruce Williams. I'm so glad you're here. This is TalkNet. Dayton, Ohio. Hello there. Hello, Bruce. It's How Craig. How are you doing? Yes, Craig. Good. I have a question for you. I uh, always try to take your advice when I can, and I came across a situation where I said to myself, what would Bruce say? And I didn't know. So, Let's find out in about two and a half minutes. Uh, no problem. Uh, my wife is looking at renting an artist studio, and uh, there's a building in town that has a lot of these artist studios available. We found one that we like. Mm -hmm. And so I asked the gentleman for a copy of the lease that I could take home and read, make sure everything seemed okay before we signed it. Mm -hmm. He said, there is no lease. It's a month to month. Uh, you pay your rent, you get to stay. There's mm -hmm. no actual signed agreement. Well, there's no, there's no compel, compelling reason why that has to exist. Okay. If you're certainly better off if, it, if you're, it's reduced to writing. Put it another way, there is nothing that compels him to give you anything in writing. Right. As far as for my protection, or actually for my wife's protection, mm -hmm. in the, the rent of the place, should we put something in writing ourselves? What good is it? It's not going to do any good unless he agrees to it in writing. True. What he's, what he's saying <clears throat> is that, look, my word is my bond. I, this is the way I do business. You pay your rent. You stay. Talk to my, 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 my tenants. <laughs> That's what he's saying. That's true. That's uh, there true. was an article in, uh, gee, I guess Danny was kind of to say that he was one of the news services. And apparently there's an attorney someplace in the country, somewhere in the south, if I recall. And uh, that's the way he did business. Apparently he, he kind of dabbled in real estate, made his money elsewhere. Hmm. And uh, he charged inordinately low rates and he bought historic properties and all this good stuff. In his will, he allowed for all this but apparently his family broke the will you see his attorney's will got broken and because he wanted the tenants to continue to stay at low rates and the family wanted no part of that they want to you know get as much as they can right and it would appear a lot of this there's a lot of disruption so there are some disadvantages here 
But if this is the conditions, uh, these are the conditions that uh, this landlord chooses to, to, I guess the word impose is not the best, but uh, set. He says, look, 200 bucks a month, pay me every month you're here. Exactly. Yeah, the, and, and, the, and on the other side of that, uh, your exposure is minimized. The only downside of this, are you going to spend a lot of money in renovations and leasehold improvements? Not really. In that That's case, true. where's the downside to you? He says, get out, you get out. That's true. That's true. So you wouldn't be opposed to uh, not having the agreement? I think if anything, it's probably in your favor, not his. Super. Super. A lot of guys think, and there was some, I had a landlord tell me this some years ago, what good is a lease? He says, if, if, if the tenant doesn't want to pay me, I'm screwed. <laughs> and if I want to get rid of them, I'll find a way. And That's you know, there's true. some merit, there's something to be said for that. Now, when you get little bigger, bigger operations, then there's something to be said for, <clears throat> for the other. I do wish you well, my friend. I do indeed. Hey, who's working tonight? Well, Jim Harmon is twisting the dials. Dallas Riggin is our guy in master control. And let me see, who is Randy Meyer is our operations manager, and of course, the redoubtable Dan Rudd. Have a great weekend, my friends. Try and do what's right. It's not the easiest thing in the world, but give it your best shot. I'm Bruce Williams. Keep in touch. Your income. That's <laughs> so. That, yeah, but you're absolutely right, and you may as well shake your head because you shake theirs, it'll rattle. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I guess at the point, if in a 30-year mortgage, if you're paying down so much per uh, per well, we, year, let's well, say. Back up. We, the fact that it's a 30 or a 15 is not relevant. Okay. The only thing is relevant is you, if you get a 15, you may get a lower interest rate. Right. But the point is, if you're paying it down, unless you can get better than that 9% or effective difference rate ah, somewhere else, that's the, but no, wait a then minute. don't the, bother. The, the first statement is, 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 was a poor one. The second one was an accurate one. Okay. Effective is the operative term here. Mm. Because you could be mesmerized uh, by the grosses and they would be not appropriate. Okay. You see what I'm saying? I do. For example, if your investment was going to be taxed uh, at a capital gains rate and you were sitting there in the effective 39% uh, or 40% Fed, but 27%, is it 27 or 28 cap? That would make a major difference, wouldn't it? Mm hmm. So the, all of these are, uh, and the bigger the numbers you play with, the more important that the, the, the percentages can be. Right, I think it's 28% cap. Yeah, but what I'm trying to get to is if you're talking about a couple million dollars. Well, I, uh, yeah. No, I'm serious. A half a point can be a very important dough. That's correct. If you're talking about $9.98 with Al Lirons in there. <laughs> well, hopefully I'll be talking about a couple million dollars I, with you from, in a few years. From your lips to God's ears. <laughs> I do wish you well, guy. Thank you, Bruce. I'm Bruce Williams. Hang in for more. Let's just talk about this guy. Just to find out the other, she feels like a half a person. Hmm. Where she'd like to find out the other half. What what has happened over the last 28 years, just to say hi. Hmm. I can understand for health reasons, you know, I want the health history. But I mean, she had somebody else who I, clearly her, her, his, her mother did eventually marry. Yes. And this other fellow raised her. Yeah, and it wasn't a happy childhood. It wasn't. This guy was not such a—he was not a particularly good look either. Right. And that's too bad. Yeah. And then the mother split from him, I take it. Right. The the mother-in-law. Right. Yeah, she left him about ten years ago. Hmm. Well, your your wife was effectively an adult at that point. Right. Hmm. Okay, so you know this guy's name. Yes, we do. You know about how old he is. Yeah. What else, what else do you know? We knew that when he left Wisconsin, he went to Michigan or Ohio. Or Ohio. Or he went to Ohio. Oh, okay. And we found his sister, but she won't help us at all. Why? She seemed really excited when we talked to her yeah. the first time. And then when we talked to her the second time, she said, don't ever call here again, and hung up. Well, she probably talked to her brother. Right. And the brother said, I don't want to know. And we are just wondering if you had any other... Well, I mean, how badly do you want to find out? If, do you still know where the sister is? Yes, we do. Well, any, uh, any decent skip tracer, given that information, could find out. Oh, okay, because we've tried a skip tracer and nothing what did he say that there isn't 
any history. And you don't have to have any history. You know the guy's name and you know where his sister is and she's alive. Right. We're, I'm making an assumption. Now, I'm making an assumption now that she knows where the guy is. And that, would appear, that would appear to be a reasonable assumption. Would you not agree? Right. Okay. Given that information, I'd be willing to gamble with you. I could do it. I do what I I would Connor, very frankly. Uh huh. I mean, I might Connor with an ins with insurance forms. I might Connor with a with a a phony legacy. You know, that somebody died and left him some money. Oh. I can think of I can think of a lot of ways. I mean, I did that when I was a kid for a living. Oh, okay, because nothing that we've tried has. Well, I can appreciate that. Tell you what you do if you want to drop me a what, what station you listen to. Well, that was the second question I had for you. When are we going to get you back here in Minneapolis? That's a good question. I don't know. KSTP used to carry us. Right. And they do not anymore. When the weather's clear, I can catch you out of Forest Lake or El Sox Center. Well, you drop a drop me a card and carry whatever station you listen to. Okay. Or a note, a letter. W-H-O out of Des Moines. Well, that's fine. And you re remind me of this conversation. And if you wish, I will put you in touch with a guy that I'm pretty certain can do the job for you. Thank you very much. I mean, much. it's going to cost you some money, I'll tell you. That's fine. It's not going to be, you know, 15 cents, but I don't think there's much question in making the assumption that, you, that the sister knows where this guy is. That information can be, a, she might not like the way you get it, and it may not be a lot of folks who say, oh, you can't do that sort of thing. Trust me, it happens all the time. Sounds great. I do wish you well, my friend. Thank you very much, Bruce. I'm Bruce Williams. Hang in. This is TalkNet. <laughs> Let's go to Boise, Idaho, and see what's developing. Yes, hello, Bruce. Hello there. This is Arlene from Boise, and I'd like to have you explain the difference between a financial planner and an investment broker. Well, you, first of all, there's no clear definition of any of these terms. Uh, if one says certified financial planner, that's a little different matter. Then we know, uh, assuming that they are telling us the truth, that they have been, they've studied it, one of the two institutions in the country, one in Atlanta, the other in Denver, uh, and they've been certified as a financial planner. Okay. Uh, a financial planner is one, now that may, you see, we even get a, that gets a little hairy too, because you want to be, if you're an insurance salesman, you can quite legitimately call yourself a financial planner. Oh. If you're a stock broker, you can call yourself a financial planner. If you're a talk show host, you can call yourself a financial planner. Not a certified, but a, but a financial planner. There's no standard for the phrase. Okay. Uh, generally speaking, these are people that will help you in one way or another uh, to make decisions as to investments. Okay. Now, we get into, we get into another sp uh, spinoff here. Fee-based, F-E-E, -E, or commission-based. Do you know the difference? Commission-based is what this one would be. Say that again, please. Commission-based is what I'm looking at. Okay, that's a salesperson. Mm -hmm. Now, the argument, and it's not a bad argument, is that what the heck, somebody's going to make a commission. Why shouldn't the salesperson selling you make the commission so you get the advice free? Okay. The counter argument to that is, well, the person making a commission may, I didn't say is, may be prejudiced toward the stuff that they're selling. In other words, if, if, if someone only sells insurance, it's highly unlikely they're going to recommend a mutual fund to you. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, a fee-based uh, person, theoretically, and we're all, this is all theory, okay. only, only is rewarded by the fee. So it, he, will, he or she will make the most appropriate uh, recommendations because it doesn't matter to them. Oh. Hello. Okay. Do you see what I'm uh, saying? Now, what was the other guy you you, you dug up here? Investment broker. I'm not sure what that is. I don't know that there's any clear definition. Well, they say they went to school and studied it. It's the, where did they go to school? I, I don't know. I haven't had an appointment with him. Well, I mean, how do you know they went to school and, quote, studied it? This was another individual who had used this person. Yeah. And they were... Uh, very pleased with the well, what did this per what did this person do for your friend well they're turning over their iris to him and then they're rolling over uh, their uh, what we call tax cap 
into his uh, brokerage firm where he'll invest it in mutuals and various other things for them and then they would be able to draw like he said possibly a 250 a month per 50,000 that's in this ho oh, oh, ho oh, oh. do that again excuse me say that one all over again okay so he is going to invest their funds yeah in how, how much money I don't know how much they have, but anyway, he he said they would net back out of the investment two hundred and fifty dollars per month for every fifty thousand they put in. All right, wait a minute. Two fifty, uh, twenty-five, or three thousand. That's that's six percent. Okay. That's not very much. You okay. Seven, you get seven percent from treasuries. Oh, so that's probably the best way to look at it, then, is the percentage of the... Uh... Well, well, wait a minute. No, there's a lot of variables here, you see. You, you're leaving an awful lot out. Okay. And, and I don't mean that you're doing that deliberately, mm -hmm. but you're leaving a lot out. You didn't say how it was to be invested. Maybe it's in some kind of a security that's going to go up in value. I don't think so. Maybe no. it's in something to go down in value. Maybe it's an insurance product. I mean, you don't know, and I don't know. So you'd have to check on the um, stability of whatever the investment was. Well, you have to know what it is, of course. Okay. Of course. Okay. Do you see why? Yes. Because you could go totally broke. Well, be, yeah. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's the result. But I mean, what you're talking about here is uh, we're we're floundering around completely in in the dark here. It sounds to me like though the broker is finding uh, investment vehicles. And I don't know what they are, but I'd sure want to know. Mm -hmm. When somebody says, "Well, I've studied for this," well, where did you study? What what degree was conferred by whom, and so on? How do I check? That? Oh, okay. Some of the stuff I want to know. Okay, I can find out then what degree. You want to find out where he got his education in what? Mm -hmm. Okay. You understand what I'm saying? Yes, I do. I do wish you well, dear. Okay, thank be you very much. Be, be very, very careful. West Hyannis, Mass. Hello. Hello, how are you, Bruce? I'm just fine, thank you. Well, Cape Cod loves you. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> a little drafty up there right now, isn't yes, it? Yes, it is blowing a gale. I was wondering if you could tell me if what happened to us a few weeks ago was unique or if it happened quite often. My husband and I just closed on a, a new home that we bought. Mm -hmm. And to make a long story short, everything has worked out. But in the process of just getting ready for approval on the loan for the mortgage, the credit check came back and indicated that there was an $11,000 loan which we had actually paid off for a boat two years previously mm -hmm. um, with a with a bank mm -hmm. that during the, the credit check the bank actually refused to update the account and because they refused to update it it actually made it appear as if the account was still current what does that mean refuse to update they actually had it printed on you know we as the the potential buyer get a printout of what the credit shows mm -hmm. and it indicated all the accounts and loans and things and actually in the last seven years that we've had mm -hmm. and it show, showed this account that it was open two years it, showed, ago. it shows it as still outstanding well what it says is it just says refuses to update and so, well, the, but, but what is the status of the account as we speak? In not, not, yes. no, you told me it's paid off. Yeah, it's actually gone. It was paid off. In yes, I, no, no, I, I understand that. But as far as there, as far as this record, they are providing the credit reporting agency, Equifax, or happens to be. What does it say the status is? It says the date that it was opened. Yeah. And it shows the amount, which was eleven thousand dollars. Right. And then that's all it shows. And then underneath it, it says refuses to update. Well, there's a couple of things you have to know here. So stick around just a minute. I'm Bruce Williams. I'm so pleased you're here. This is talk. I am chatting a lady in West High Annisport, Massachusetts. Uh, when she was applying for a mortgage, she came to find out that a loan that had been retired a couple of years earlier was still shown. And I'm a little unclear on this. Is outstanding or not closed or just they don't want to tell you what it is? Well, that's the thing. It didn't. All it all it indicated was the date that it was opened with the account number. Right. And then underneath it, the bank just printed in refused. 
to update. Oh, I mean, did, in other did, words, the credit check re- uh, indicated Have you, have you contacted the, the uh, lender in question? Yeah, so I immediately called the bank and I said, um, you know, what my name was and I gave them my account number and what evidently had happened is the bank had been taken over by another bank within the last two years. Yeah, in Massachusetts, what a surprise. <laughs> and in the process, um, actually, because the loan had been paid off, there wasn't any current information up on their screen. And so when I questioned, well, you know, I've paid this off, she said, well, do you have your, your notice, your letter? And I said, you know, I've looked all night in my files and I can't find that one letter. But I said, I don't have the account with you folks anymore. And I said, can you, you know, give me something? And she said, well, I'd have to look, you know, and it would take a while. And I look, was she had to look what? what She'd have to look in her files because, you know, it was such an old account at this point. And then I said, you know, I don't understand this. The, the account's been paid off. Um, I can't find the proof of it. But you can't prove that I actually even own the account except the account was open. Well, hold on. Take a deep breath. I mean, I, I, I must assume that someplace in your files you still have the canceled checks. Yes. Well, you got something then. I had something, but it was a matter of time because we had all our things in storage at the time. And it was going to take what looked to me just an impossible feat to find this within a couple of days to clear it up for the mortgage approval. Mm -hmm. Um, What I asked her, which was the thing that astonished me the most, was why was it that they printed out that they would refuse to update this account? It just they why they couldn't show the account was closed and paid in full. And she said... Well, you know, the the credit network that was checking on your account is not the network that we deal with within our circle. So it is our right as a bank to refuse to give them any information. And I I didn't know if you've ever heard of this. Oh, yeah. For example, if you just because you have credit with somebody, they don't have to put you into the computer. But for example, you know, people say, well, I have credit with the XYZ credit card because there is one credit card that gives nothing. Mm-hmm. Except bad information, but no good. And you, they, well, they have to tell these people that I have credit with them. They don't tell them anything. Now you see, if they just, if they elect to participate, now there, I'm sure there's some exceptions to this, but if they elect to participate in a given program, they they also ordinarily agree to put information in and take information out. Because obviously, if everybody takes and nobody puts, there's nothing to take. Mm-hmm. But there's no obligation on their part to cooperate. Well, that's that's the thing that just shocked me and really concerned me, especially, you know, we this was not the first home we bought, so we dealt with all of this before. But I was thinking, you know, for a first-time buyer or whatever, it's very, very upsetting. And I said to the bank, I said, you know, I don't understand why it is that I can come in, pay a loan off, and all you are willing to put out there is that I once had a loan with you and then refused to even give the present day status. I said, you know, you leave us hanging as if we still have a current Indeed. account with you. And it certainly isn't good business, but the point is they cannot be required to do that. That's amazing. That's the, well, I don't know if it is or it isn't. Yeah. Uh, they could take the position that we don't have, you know, it costs us money to give you a credit reference. How does it cost the bank money? It takes time to answer requests. It probably takes them as much time to say there's an account here this is what the date was and the amount maybe so I, but i mean I, they could take that position whether it's true or not another story i i talked to a very good friend the other day uh who was an attorney and he and we got talking about the cost of certain services he said it cost me 35 dollars to send a letter and i said well i don't know if i agree with the way you t- the way you charge off your expenses and we you know we we're having an academic discussion this wasn't a fight or anything but it's a question of bookkeeping in that instance, you see. And they may have determined that it cost them money and they're not going to spend that money. You know, fortunately for, for us, I dealt with a lady at the bank who realized that we were about ready to lose uh, a mortgage. You were going to lose it over this? Well, it was, you know, when it was an $11,000 hangover, which at that time, because of the time period, was given on the conditions of the contract for the house. Um, could have postponed the approval and Mm. she was very understanding and really went out of her way to help me get verification that the account was indeed closed Mm. 
But I guess the lesson I learned from that was absolutely <laughs> never to lose track of anything. Well, keep you you got to, it, and that isn't such a, well, of course, maybe it's not unfortunate because we always figure, well, the other guy's got their records. Right. And the other guy, unhappily, has to be us. I do wish you well. Good luck with the new house. You handled it well. I'm Bruce Williams. This is TalkNet. We go now to Ithaca, New York. Hello there. Hi, Bruce. Hi, Bruce. Hello there. How are you? Good. Great program. I listen to it every night. <laughs> well, I'm glad you're with me, my friend. Great. Uh, I'm a student at Cornell University here. Oh, a graduate far, student. And far above Cayuga's waters, there's an awful smell. A beautiful place. Somehow, well, that was the song I remember. <laughs> there's an awful smell. Some say it's Cayuga's waters. We say it's court. Never mind. <laughs> anyway, you're a grad student up there in the cold country, huh? Uh, yes, I am. And I'm finding myself borrowing a lot of money for education. Well, you're uh, not alone in that retirement. Yes. Yeah. Now, my quick question is, uh, is should I just pay it off as soon as I get out of school? I would. And just get my hands off and just start life without, without any... Uh, Hold back, so well, look, you're making the best investment in the world, assuming you're learning something and you right. chose you chose a discipline that has some marketability. I studied, I'm studying architecture. Okay. I mean, there are people that you know, will study uh, biblical studies or something, right. you know, and it's all very well. It's a great academic pursuit, but where do you go with that? And you go into Hawk for thirty or forty thousand dollars, and you can't get a job. That's right. a serious problem. But you're you're you are going to you're going to trade school right now. Okay. Would you agree to that? Yeah. Okay. And you're learning a craft, and you're investing in yourself. Mm -hmm. But in my opinion, you're better off. Even if the interest rates are favorable, you're still better off to unload it. Get rid of that that burden as quickly as you're able. All right. Now, the other question I have for you is, what is the best advice you can get for a person just about to go in the real world? And huh. I know it's like a tough question, but I mean, what do you think? I mean, you have a lot of experience with it. It is good. You are. You're, a, you're kind of a people in training right now. And pretty soon you're going to be out there in the real world. Right. Oh, there's no, I can't give any general advice. My, my, my father uh, told me something that did well for me was get on a payroll. In other words... Don't be so picky. I hear people, I can't afford to take that job. I'm trained to do this and that. So what? Right. I don't care. Maybe you're trained to to uh, design tall buildings, but the only job available is throwing the garbage in the back of the truck. Wear a warm sweater. It's cold in the wintertime. <laughs> you, do what, you do what one has to do. I was listening earlier today. I listen to a lot of talk radio. Right. And I was listening to the former mayor of New York. Uh, Ed Koch. Eddie Koch, right. Yeah. Yeah, I used, to, I used to listen to that when I was in New York City. Uh huh. <laughs> so I think Mr. Koch is an interesting guy. I don't always agree with him. Uh, I was, we were both guests on a talk show at one time, and uh, he didn't have anything to say to me. We're sort of sitting there in the, in the what amounted to the green room. Right. And then somebody said, "Oh, that's Bruce Williams. He has, you know, so many million listeners." Oh, then he was very friendly. Say, up until that time, he was. I was, I was a little disappointed in that. Tell you the truth. Uh huh. Because, I mean, he's a nice guy, but he's still only on one lousy radio. It's a very nice radio station, but he's on one station. Right. Which doesn't exactly make you a killer in our business. But in any event, he was going on today about uh, different jobs. He was talking specifically about driving cabs. Right. Which is near and dear to my heart since I drove a cab when I was in college. And uh, I remember very well how many guys were... were well above what we might term the uh, uh, minimum qualifications to drive a taxi cab. And there are a couple of guys that I remember that were from other countries that had you know, advanced degrees in other disciplines. One was a physician, right. but he couldn't get licensed. And he was waiting to get licensed. In the meantime, he got eight. You do what you have to do. Well, Koch was going on today about uh, this business of Mayor Dinkins was having a stroke because a cab driver refused to pick him up. And obviously it was because he was black and they didn't want, they didn't want to go to a black neighborhood. But then Koch pointed out that there are, I don't know how many times the number of cab drivers get killed versus police. It's the most right. dangerous job in the city of New York is driving a cab, bar none. 227 people killed or something, but some outrageous number and whatever. And he was, but then he put the whole thing was he was saying that, and he appreciated how bad this was. 
and only but only a third of the people driving cabs are white anyway to begin with so right. it, the chances are, are are two and three that it would be a non-white person discriminating but he said no matter how bad it is if you're out there you got to pick up everybody and otherwise give up your job well the ration the rationality of that escaped me completely uh you know if it's a it, that means that the rest of the people uh are to do without a service because the, with 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 clear reason a lot of people are afraid to go into bad areas and even not because of the person they're picking up but what might happen to them when they go into these areas well, you gotta get out of there yeah and how do you get out but the whole point is you're a grad student you got a degree in architecture the whole routine if that's the job that you can get grab it but don't get too proud basically. i exactly i did right. and it didn't kill me i've done other things huh? get on a payroll no matter what it is you can always climb off when a better opportunity comes by Okay. But, but so many people sit around and they're, they're going to wait until a right job comes along. The right job is the first one that's offered to you. Okay. Bundle up. It's going to be a cold winter, kid. All right. Thanks a lot. I do wish yeah. you well. Pocatello. Another place that's cold. Pocatello, Idaho. Hello. Hey, Pocatello, are you hiding? <laughs> well, wish we can find him while we take a little time out. I'm Bruce Williams. This is TalkNet. Muskegon, Michigan. Hello there. Hi, Bruce. How are you? I am fine, thank you. Good. I don't know whether to say happy anniversary to you or not. Well, listen, it's a very happy anniversary. I'm alive and kicking. Absolutely. Hey, listen, uh, your, your first call this evening kind of provoked this call regarding the moral question of returning some money. Well, let's recap. We don't ordinarily do this because it's a different hour. But oh, I'm sorry. It's okay. The uh, brought down to its essence. He went to one of these ubiquitous cash machines, asked for three, they gave him 600 Correct. And apparently no record, or at least his, his bill says 300 The machine perhaps made a mistake. This uh, particular uh, predicament is a little more substantial in dollars. Okay. We recently purchased a home for cash. Did you? And Boy, that doesn't happen often. Well, I, I don't know. I would imagine not. Uh, at the closing, the title company, all the papers were signed, documents were signed, and they did not... Um, uh, ask, actually, let me back up a step. We we got a single payment note from a bank, and the uh, uh, we had to come up with a percentage of that note. It wasn't not a conventional mortgage. A uh, single payment note. What was that? Tell me why you structured it that way and how. Uh, there was a sense of urgency, and without going into, into a lot of detail, there was simply a sense of urgency to purchase the home. To get the closing done. Correct. All right. So you got a short-term note from the bank? Is Correct. That it? And we had to come up with a certain percentage oh, of... Android, give me some numbers. Um, uh, I, I'm kind of hesitant to do that simply because I don't know how many deals... For, well, let, me, let, me, let me get ahead first, and then you tell me if you still want the numbers. Go ahead. I'm just trying to protect myself. Go ahead. Um, the the uh, down payment, which was substantial in excess of, of $5,000, was not uh, requested nor given by us at the closing. And we walked out without leaving them the check. And then they gave you a credit for 5000 Is that what you're telling me? No. The bank uh, gave us a note, and plus, at the closing, we were supposed to put the additional dollar amount down to close the deal. Mm -hmm. So the title company, or the seller, got their full payment from the title company. Mm -hmm. The checks were issued to the parties, and we witnessed that. And we walked out without leaving them our down payment. How long ago was this? About three weeks. They'll catch it. That's what I figured. But that's something like that. That'll be caught. Might might take them a month. Might take them two months. But I, I'd be. And it, it could be forever. It could not be. It may not be forever. But I think they'll catch that. What, what is? And, I, and again, we're we are obviously liable for that amount. Oh, I don't think there's any question about that. Okay. Um, what if the home is sold? In the interim, you st that doesn't doesn't in any way diminish your liability. Okay. It may it might diminish their ability to collect. Because you know you may, may leave the state or, or spend the money in no. Las Vegas or a million other things. But that that the your ability to pay and your obligation to pay are not handmaidens. Okay, be nice from their point of view if they were. But you can get a judgment against somebody for a million bucks hasn't got a quarter. Sure. Sure. Well, we're not looking to run away from it. I, and quite honestly, we didn't discover it until we had walked out, and and um, we just put the money back in the bank. <laughs> I bet you did. <laughs> That's all I needed, sir. Congratulations, and it's good to have you around. Thank you very much, Thanks. Guy. Bye -bye. I do wish you well. 
Savannah GA. Hello there. Welcome to TalkNet. Hi, Bruce. Welcome back to WBMQ in Savannah. Well, we're happy to be there, guy. Uh, what I need to talk to you about, a couple months ago I got in the mail a certified letter from my mother, and in it was a quick claims deed to her property up in Indiana. Mm -hmm. And uh, realizing that statutes vary from state to state, I just wondered uh, generally what is a quick claims deed, what's its purpose, and what are my liabilities and responsibilities? Okay, well, I think the word is claim, singular rather than plural. Okay. Not yes. that it's a major distinction, but I think it's called a quick claim deed. Quick claim, you're uh, correct. Uh -huh. And what we're, what it, all, you, all it does, uh, I'm, well, I'm going to ask a couple of questions in a moment, but you asked specifically what is a quick claim. It is someone who gives up their right and interest in a property, not necessarily their obligations. As an example, if I owned a house with a mortgage on it, I could quit claim my interest to you, but that wouldn't diminish my obligation to make the mortgage payments. I see. I'd have no interest. You got it now. Uh -huh. But I had to still got the. I just don't get off the hook for paying the bank because I happen to say, "Hey, Charlie, take my interest here." Right. Now, your mom apparently wants to give you this is a house. It's a, yes, a house on about an acre and a half. Okay, probably. she wants to give it to you. Right. Is it free and clear of debt? No, it's not. It's. Uh, uh, I think it has another ten years of mortgage on it. Well, why is she doing this? I, let me guess. Maybe your mother's along in years. Yes, she is. She's worried that if she gets has to go to a nursing home and so on and so forth? Uh, well, my father passed away and left her some debt. And on the advice of her lawyer, she did this. Well, how much debt? Uh, I'm not sure, really. Some credit card debts. Well, but that, that doesn't... In, 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 what, she, what she's trying to do is avoid having them come after her house. Right. Yeah, but they can't do that. That's fraud. Okay. If she... I don't care. I mean, her lawyer told her to do it. I don't want to contravene the lawyer. But the fact is that she's getting rid of an asset in anticipation of not paying her creditors. Right. Huh. That's called fraud. Okay. Well, she's not uh, having any problems paying her creditors, and uh, she never did have problems. But well, then why would he tell her to do that? I don't know. Well, I mean, uh, uh, if she's paying the creditors, then there's no fraud, but then there's no advantage to her. Right. Uh, when I asked the question of you, you said, yeah, that's why I went to the fraud kick. Yeah. But if she's paying everybody off... Give her some money. Yeah, this, uh, like I say, come out of the blue. Uh, I was, I was no, I had no idea it was coming. And uh, I, I'm curious about my, my uh, liabilities. I don't have any liability. Uh -huh. Get an asset, or you have an interest in an asset that's already encumbered, encumbered to the extent of the mortgage. Yeah. How much is the, how much is the house worth in your opinion, if you're doing now? Oh, it's about thirty-five thousand. And how much does she owe on it? I would say she owes uh, 16. Okay, so she made a gift to you. That's another problem with that, too. Uh -huh. Did she give it to you, to you personally or to you and your wife or what? It's to me personally. Well, then, they, then she may have incurred some tax liability doing that. Uh -huh. the, the, the tax liability is to the giver, not to the recipient. And if, if, if she gave you over $10,000, then she owes some taxes, which she can avoid by claiming against her lifetime exemption, her lifetime estate. Okay. Well, I don't know who's giving her this advice. Was this a, was the the quit claim recorded any place? It is recorded in uh, in a county in Indiana. Um, I'd sit down and find out what she's trying to accomplish. Yeah. You might want to call the lawyer involved and ask him why he told her to do this. Well, I've, I've tried. I was in the military at the time, and I had the uh, uh, legal advisor call. Yeah. And, uh, what did they say? Uh, he got nowhere with him. I've, I've written the lawyer myself and got nothing back from him. Huh. Uh, you went to buy the base legal and they couldn't do anything, huh? Right. No, they, uh, the guy wouldn't respond? No, he sure wouldn't. And uh, he, he's really closed mouth about this and uh, doesn't want to give me any, any information either. I, I may need to get a lawyer here. Yeah, I would want to get some advice as to whether or not you're, this was a, a wise thing for your mother to do, a necessary thing to do, or a legal thing to do. Yeah. Uh, hmm. How long ago did this all happen? Uh, about six months ago. Yeah. Well, yeah, you want to be certain that, uh, as I said also, that that she files the appropriate forms with, the, with her tax return. Mm-hmm. 
And I'm not certain if that has to be done in this calendar year or if you can wait until she files. I don't know the answer to that either. Yeah. But I'd sure ask the question. Be be a shame for her to pay taxes on this silly transaction. Yeah. When it might have might, when it might not have been necessary, and it most clearly. I mean, the tra I, what I'm trying to say that the transaction may have not been necessary. Yeah. And clearly. The taxes can be uh, avoided if, if the appropriate forms are filed, but I'm not clear on whether they be filed at filing or have to be done whenever you get involved in something like this. So I get some advice in that regard as well. Yeah. Okay. I do wish you well, Guy. Oh, thank you much, Bruce. It's been good talking to you. Twin Falls, Idaho. Hello. Hello. Yes. Yes, sir. Yes. I'm right here. Okay. Uh, I was working for a company... And uh, I had my index finger amputated in a machine. Mm, how nice. I went to a doctor that the company sent me to. Mm -hmm. The doctor at that time, after I, I had a few surgeries and stuff, and I, t I asked him if how I How long ago was all this? Oh, this was in 91. Okay. Okay, I said, uh, if I have any problems with my finger, what do I do? And he goes, well, you just come right on back in here. This is an open claim. It, it, it should be open for at least five years. Mm -hmm. I said, okay. And I said, so I have to go into the office and get an okay to come in first? And he said, no. This is an open claim. You don't have to. I said, all right. So you're continuing to work for the company, right? I was continuing. Uh, then I uh, went back to see him. And when I went back to work after I saw the doctor, because my finger was bothering my knuckle, he told me I get arthritis in it most likely. Mm -hmm. Well, I went back to see him. And the, when I went back to work, they called me into the office and said, you didn't have authorization to go to that doctor. I said, hey, well, I told them what he had told me, mm -hmm. and they, they told me, well, you have to get authorization. This is a new claim, a new injury. I huh. said, fine, whatever. You know, there was nothing really done. They gave me a write-up is what they did. They wrote me up as a disciplinary action for not getting prior authorization. Well, then uh, about two years went by, still at the same company, and one of the supervisors put on a forklift, and he came flying across the warehouse and slammed into me with a forklift. You're and it, it, it hurt my back. I guess so I, a lot of things. Yeah, this is a real unsafe place. But they sent me to another doctor of their choosing, and uh, the doctor told me, he said, there's nothing he can really do for me, but if it doesn't get better, come back in. Well, it was really starting to bother me one afternoon before work, and I went to his office, and it was closed. He was, I guess, in a meeting or doing something, so I went over to the regional hospital in Twin Falls to the emergency to have my back looked at. Mm -hmm. And when I went to work... The, later on that day, they brought me in the office and suspended me and then told me that I went without authorization and that I was terminated. And I was wondering if that would be construed as grounds for uh, for termination or... Well, I, I'm not certain that, that, that you, the, you, they can usually let you go. But whether they can let you go for something like that is another question. Uh, it would seem to me you might have a grounds of a, a wrongful termination suit. Uh, on a, um, first of all, you could easily contend that you went back to the hospital because it was hurting you and it was an emergency. Mm -hmm. That's your contention. They could dispute that. You're saying, look, my back hurt like crazy and I couldn't find a doctor and I, I wanted to get it looked after. Uh -huh. uh, but I think you ought to be talking to an attorney. Yeah. Okay. I thank you for your I mean, time. Unhappily, you know, they, they, I don't know why they would do that unless they were out gunning for you. We, I Which think so. Know. After I cut my finger off, they were really kind of out to get me from that point. Why? Uh, were you I, careless? They thought. No, I went to an attorney about that, and uh, I guess they got real uptight because I went to an attorney. Oh, that's kind of stupid in their part. Our telephone number is eight hundred seven four three eight thousand. I'm Bruce Williams. This is Talk. Orlando, Florida, the home of Mickey Mouse, Tom Darren, and a whole bunch of other miscreants. Hello there. Hello, how are you, sir? I am fine, thank you. What's on your mind? Um, I was trying to buy a business, and a uh, friend of mine, he, asked, uh, he gave me a uh, lawyer name to go review the papers, work with them, and stuff like that. Yeah. So uh, I went over there and I didn't find no papers with a lawyer. I don't have good. I don't have experience with lawyers at all. Well, what kind of business were you buying? I was gonna buy a supermarket, big supermarket. Hmm. Well, you surely need some legal advice in a transaction of that size, I would think. Exactly. Go ahead. And um, I give him the contract. It's a two basis contract, and there's a lease and everything else. And he was uh, he was making some. Uh, Phone, uh, a few phone calls for me and everything, and like uh, 
10 days later, he sent me, he, he, for, in the beginning, he asked me for $2,000 before he started doing anything. So I did give him a check, $2,000. Yeah. And then uh, 10 days later, he sent me uh, the bill. And the bill was like $840. And um, $800, $800 more? No, just $800, $840 for, for whatever he done already. But, and I called him, I said, uh, $840 right now, I mean, like, uh, are you sure you put that much time on it? He said, yes. And he said, like, uh, conversation with me takes like 70% 70, 70 of the hours and reviewing the, the contract, three, you know, three hours and 70% of the hours and phone calls with a store owner and stuff like that. No, you lost me a little bit. How, he, he, look, he's charged you 800 bucks, right? Right. How much is his hourly rate? $150. All right. So what do you, I bet it's 150, two hours would be 300, four hours would be six. We're talking about five hours work. Yeah. He, he said he put already five hours and 60% of the hour. 5.6 hours. 5.6 hours. All right. So go ahead. And um, uh, the deal didn't go through. So uh -huh. uh, I talked to the... Um, to the guy I was going to buy the store from, and I also talked to the real estate man, and uh, they asked me, like, how much you pay him and stuff, and I showed him, like, how much uh, the bill, and they, he, they said, uh, no, no way, we don't talk to him that much. We, we, did, we did not talk to him that much. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I called the lawyer. I told him to send me the rest of the money, and uh, he said, yeah, he will, he will send me the rest of the money, but he did not. Like, I gave him, like, two weeks, and he didn't. So I called him like three days ago. Um, he did not answer the phone. He said, uh, you know, I left a message for him and he didn't call me back. So I'm wondering what, you know, what can I do? Well, what you can do, if you, you can call him. If he doesn't call back, call the Bar Association. Bar Association? The Bar, B-A-R Association in the county where he is located. Right. And you want to talk to someone from the FEE, F-E-E, -E, Disputes Committee. Yeah, he will not like that very much. Oh, that's good. <laughs> I wish you well, kid. Thank you. Take good care. Cincinnati, it's your turn. Hello. Yes, Bruce? Yeah. Um, Who yeah. else did you expect? I was hoping it'd be you. Okay. Uh, this is Henry, and uh, I've got an older house, and I've just, uh, my job description has changed a little, and I've always been a do-it-yourselfer, and I'm never here anymore, but I have a lot of work. It seems like in the past it's always been by the time I got done with one room or one part, it's time to start on the other. Uh, I just got a $50,000 loan uh, approved, and um, I still would kind of like to contract for the work, but I wouldn't be here to do it all. And I, I've got a, a lot of stuff needs to be done, and I don't know what order to go in necessarily. Is that enough information? You need more. Well, not really. Uh, I'm not okay. sure what you want to accomplish, or you say you don't know what order to go in. Okay. For example, if you're if you're going to do the inside of a house, you most certainly would do the painting before you lay the rugs. Okay. Or do me... the floors. I mean, what are you? What are we talking about here? All right, we're talking about uh, heating and air conditioning system. We're talking about bathroom, kitchen. Uh, remodeling. We're talking about making two rooms up in the attic that are presently just storage into actual bedrooms mm -hmm. or something on that order. Uh, one of the problems with the heating uh, and the air conditioning I've found is the asbestos pipes in the basement. I don't know if uh, they're going to have to all come out. Is that a, uh, how would you go about that sort of thing? You say asbe you mean asbestos insulation on the pipes? Correct. Not the asbestos pipes themselves. The clamshell insulation? Right. Yeah, if, legally, that's got to be taken out by a licensed um, disposer of hazardous material. Okay, and there isn't any, I mean, it, uh, I was wondering about disturbing it. Aren't you even, you know, stirring up a hornet's nest by doing that? But it's got to go, I guess, if we're going to... Well, I don't know if it has to go, but it, that, that is a type of asbestos that does deteriorate. And when it deteriorates, it can cause problems. Okay. But unlike asbestos tile, which will stay in its non-toxic form for a zillion years... Do you recommend someone trying to do this or get a general contractor? Well, it depends on the time, you see. You, you, you said someplace in our conversation that you don't have as much time as you used to have. That's correct. Well, but my daughter, uh, who lives with me now, is more, and she is on the other phone, is more than willing to spend the time and energy to get this job done. I mean, is she able, though? 
Yeah, she's very... Well, no, I'm not meaning that sparingly. I mean, can she put in a a, a new sink? No, I don't mean do it. She's going to find the contractors, and we just, where we're really at right now is how we go about uh, finding reputable people, what we need to watch out for, uh, what order. I mean, like, we have a foundation problem, so I suppose... If you have to ask those questions, I don't think you're capable of getting the job done. Say again? If you have to ask the questions you just put forward... I don't believe it's that you that, that you have the ability to do it correctly. And I don't mean that in any way in a critical. I mean, that's an observation. So you're thinking a general contractor would be best, right? I would think so, yeah. But let somebody come in and have them, or you might have two or three come in, and let them bid on the whole thing. They get the subs and so forth. Would, um, if uh, we wanted to look into it ourselves, do you have anything recommended as far as reading into doing this? I don't know anywhere you can read for that. I thought maybe we'd get ourselves better educated and we'd be in a better place to do it ourselves then. Well, the problem with that scenario is, it, can you afford the tuition? Uh, you mean finding out the hard way that we weren't good enough to do yes, it? Exactly so. Okay. Um, well, it sounds like uh, we're going to need to look into some general contractors, find out in your own experience, is the price going to be that much greater when you have someone coordinate everything? Not really, because the, the, the offset is that the general contractor, if he or she is good and knows what they're up to, they'll get prices, for example, on the heating and air conditioning you couldn't touch. Now, why is that? Because hopefully they're throwing the guy a fair amount of business, and they'll, they'll give him a better deal. The same thing is true with the guy who does the, the remodeling in the kitchen. The whole works is there's there's extra money in there for referral fees or finders fees or whatever that you're not going to have access to. So I would say that good general can do it as cheap or cheaper than you can do it. Okay. And assuming that you're not doing any work yourself, that's where the that's where the savings are. When you're in there laying the tile or ripping up the floors, that's where the savings are. It certainly is not just screwing around trying to place the work as I see it. Okay, we'll uh, take all your information. But be very advice. careful. If there are contracts to be signed, please have them reviewed by an attorney. Be extremely careful with the general with the, and with uh, the possibility of mechanics liens by the secondary contractors or the, or the subs. So, would the general contractor wouldn't look into that? We need to double Yeah, check. he'd look into it, but he can screw you. Okay. You give him money, he doesn't pay the sub. you got to pay the sub again. I got you. Can I ask you one more quick question? Yes, yeah, sure. the same. Yeah. On the $50,000 loan, um, I've mentioned that I'm making more money than I was in the past, but if something were to happen to me, uh, <clears throat> incapacitated and or death, heavens forbid, um, they have insurance, but they're talking like eight or $9,000. For what? What do you think of that? For fifty thousand, eight or nine thousand premium? Yeah, that's what I thought that was. Well, how high. old are you? I'm forty two. What kind of shape are you in? Uh good physical shape. That's absurd. Construction worker. Oh, that, that's no you physically you're you know, you don't have any bad diseases, bad habits and so forth? Nope. That's absurd. What what would the ball? Oh, I can't tie I would imagine no more than five hundred bucks a year or something like that. I mean a very small amount of money. I do wish you well, Guy and Bruce Williams. This is Talknet. Lansing, hello. Hello. Yeah, I'm calling uh, about a carpet problem. Yes, sir. In my house. Uh-huh. Uh, in the middle of June, we got uh, carpet installed. Um, when we... My, I was at work. My wife was around and the... Around, huh? Yeah. She was in and out of the house when they were here working on it. And she happened to come in and uh, the carpet installer was... Uh, on the phone in a heated discussion with the carpet store yelling i guess well hold, but, but take a deep breath was, yeah. was the carpet installer a separate deal the, the carpet installer was hired by the carpet store okay that, that's what i wanted to know did you pay the carpet installer separately or no okay that was all part of a package then that's right it was a package okay and he was in a heated discussion saying that you know he's never worked going to work for them again and that He's not going to be responsible for this job. And well, what was the problem? Uh, apparently, he didn't feel that they had uh, oh, figured enough carpet. Uh, he because he was going to have to put too many seams in. You know where he didn't like the idea of the way they had. Uh, I don't know if they laid it out or told him how to do it or just shipped some carpet and him over here and told him to figure it out. You know. Mm -hmm. So anyhow, uh, my wife was. 
uh, you know, after he got off the phone, wondering what was wrong. And, of course, he was still a little bit hot under the collar. So he he says, well, I don't know. You're going to have a scene here, 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 and here, you know. And and so she called the carpet store, and the guy, got, you know, got on the phone. He says, no, that, that won't be a problem. He, the guy's just hot under the collar, you know, don't worry about it. And, and a little while later, the, the manager showed up and, says, no, you, after two weeks, you won't even see it, you know. There's see what? Any seams. <laughs> well, that, that's fictitious. Uh, and we have had carpet in the past where we didn't see the seams. That's pretty hard to do. Yeah. You got a, a seam. I don't want to say that, you, that they're going to give you any trouble, but it's pretty hard to get a seam that's totally hidden. Mm -hmm. It depends, depends upon the pattern, the type of carpeting, and all that. There's a lot of variables here. Right. All right, so let's bring this down on point. You, you Obviously, you let them do it, and you're not happy now. Correct. Um, we've been telling them ever since, you know, that uh, it wasn't good. Finally, he sent somebody out to re-stretch one area. See, there's a crate across the dining room. There's two seams about three foot apart. Well, it shouldn't be. No. And he says, well, we'll restretch it, and that should draw them down tighter, and we may have to shave a little bit of the hump off, you know, the fuzz, <laughs> so it looks level. <laughs> well, I don't think they did any shaving, but they did stretch it, and it really didn't change the appearance. Mm -hmm. And subsequently, we've found some of the seams where they really aren't tight. I mean, they're they're starting to come loose already, and uh, you you vacuum and and the, it pulls up a little. Okay, so where we, where we look? We, we we've established you're unhappy, yeah. and they're not doing anything. What now? Okay, um, he the uh, manager of the carpet store hired a carpet inspector, and I had never heard of such a thing. But well, I haven't either. And uh, he was uh, supposedly a certified carpet inspector. And Everybody should certified something. I don't know. He <laughs> he came out and he inspected everything. He got down in his hands and knees and he pried apart all the seams and he took a little tool and he wrote. He he was here for a couple hours writing notes and everything. And he, you know, wouldn't. He was uh, to the point where he really didn't want to tell us anything because he said he was working for the carpet company. And uh, but I got the impression that he really felt that it wasn't a very good job, you know. Hmm. Uh, you but didn't have to be. Uh... Know, he was not at liberty to tell us that. Mm -hmm. So doesn't sound like it'd be a rocket scientist to figure that one out. <laughs> and that was the beginning of November when he was out here, and he says we should be hearing back from the carpet company within two weeks, mm -hmm. in a couple of weeks, because his report was going to go into. What it. happened? Okay, we've never heard back. Uh, for the last couple of weeks, we've been calling them, asking for the manager who is never there, or the owner. Um, Did, has it occurred to you to go down? Oh, we've gone down. We've called. And wait, wait, wait you go down. What happens when you go down there? They just say they'll have him call us, which he doesn't. Are you a very assertive person? Uh, I, yes, I can be. Well, why don't you go down there and... So they know who you are now, I suppose. Because, mm -hmm. you know, you know I, when you walked in there, I'm sure they said, well, why do you want to see him? You said, well, I'm having trouble with my carpet, right? Mm -hmm. And maybe a, a better answer might have been, well, we, we just bought a new home, and I was told that the only guy I should talk to is him about the new carpeting. I got a feeling he might have come out of his office. <laughs> well, I really don't think he's there. Well, you don't think so? I, no, because, I mean, you can look throughout the place and not, you know, I mean, it's pretty open where you, unless he's got a hiding space somewhere. Hmm, you don't think he shows up there once in a while? Well, I, I would think so, but they say he works out of his house or something. I don't know. Hmm. I don't know if he's an installer or and just owns the place or what. I don't know. Well, where do you want to uh, go with this now? Well, uh, I just wondering if you have any suggestions. What I would do is I'd hire somebody to come in on a fee basis. It's an expert in rugs, another rug guy, installer, and have him write up a report saying all the deficiencies mm -hmm. and what it'll cost to correct them. And then I'd send them uh, a notice that if I didn't hear from them within a reasonable time, say five days, I was going to have it corrected by somebody else and look to them for the... For the uh, to be reimbursed, and that means probably small claims court. How much you pay for all this? Well, company? no, it's probably more than what we could get out of small claims court. How much was the job? For about three thousand. But how much would it take to correct it? Uh, you 
re- to do it right, it probably should be redone. Well, in that case, uh, you may have to sue him in a, a higher court. Can right. you, in your state, can you collect legal uh, your legal fees? Uh, I don't know the answer. To that. That's going to be a little tough, otherwise. Mm-hmm. But it's not going to help you to. to, to of course, the, the thing is that if you start to hit him with a suit, when you hit him with a suit, that may get his attention. Oftentimes, people can duck when they get a summons. They suddenly know that you're serious. I would, my patients, if I were, well, my patients would have long since exhausted. I think you've been too patient. I'm Bruce Williams. This is TalkNet. Billings, Montana. Hello there. Hey, Billings, are you there? Well, Mystic, Connecticut, your turn. Mystic, are you there? Yes, I am, Bruce. Wow, you? I think we're having a problem here. What's on your mind? <laughs> oh, I opened up my mail today, and I got a, a bill. Not a bill. I got a letter from the tax assessor. How interesting. Yes, yes. and uh, You didn't know you were so rich, did you? <laughs> um, now I know the, um, the meaning of uh, land rich and mm-hmm. no money in my pocket. Yeah. Well, apparently the, uh, the assessment went up 70, 70%. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's a little blurb on the bottom that if I'd like to meet with their representative, I'm welcome to. Mm-hmm. But I have it the foggiest idea how to ask them, where, how could I get this lowered besides well, pleading and begging? Well, wait a while. First of all, maybe maybe it's not supposed to be lowered. Oh, well, that's possible. I mean, we don't, you know, see, percentages don't tell us very much. Oh. Mm-hmm. If you were dramatically under-assessed before, uh, whatever the percentage was, may not be inappropriate. Mm-hmm. So forget about percentages for a moment. Okay. How much do they say your house is worth? House and land. House and land, two fourteen. And how much in your own hot little head do you think? If you, if I wanted to buy it tomorrow and you wanted to sell it tomorrow, what would you say was a reasonable number? Well, it, it's rental property. That, that is my question. If I wanted to buy it tomorrow, put it in the, in the, in the local newspaper. How much? Probably two ninety. So you're under assessed from that point of view. Correct. Okay. Now, next question: Have you, have you looked at the lo- at your neighbor's properties? That's um, what you got to do. Properties that are, are are of similar size and so forth, mm-hmm. and see how they're assessed. Okay. And if they're assessed at the same ratio, then you have nothing to complain about. That's true. And you also should know something else, by the way. Without, you don't have to plead or whatever, but there is a time of the year, and it varies from place to place, mm-hmm. when you can appeal. You just can't. I was out with, to, with a good friend for lunch today, and he was talking about an assessment he felt was unreasonable. I don't disagree in his case. Uh, I said, did you appeal? He said, I missed the appellate date. Yeah, so it's usually only once a year in most areas. Oh, okay. But what you should understand, and mo- I can't speak for Connecticut. I don't know the answer to that, sure. but, but, it, but it is true many places. If you appeal, mm-hmm. they can raise your taxes. Oh, goodness. It opens the door, in other words. Mm-hmm. And if that door is open and the, and the appellate board or however it's handled says, hey, yeah, that house isn't worth 24 you You're absolutely right, Mr. Stoyan. It's worth 260 So just understand, you may be opening a, a door. And, and you know, the fact that it's under-assessed in terms of, of um, its actual value is only one factor. you got to find out how the other properties in the area similarly legitimately priced are assessed. It's the ratio that's important. Good luck, my friend. I'm Bruce Wiggins. This is Talk Night. Summit, Colorado. Hello there. Hi, Bruce. I have a a problem I've never heard on your program before. Well, let's talk about it. 37 years ago, I bought some mountain property, and I was with the surveyor when he staked out the ground. 37 years ago? Yep. Okay. And he picked up a blaze line that he said was close to where the Forest Service line should have been. Picked up a what line? A blaze line in the timber. I'm not sure what that is. Well, the trees are some of the bark peeled off to mark a line going through the timber. Huh. It's called a blaze. Okay. On that blaze was a sign that's typical of marking the boundary between private and property and national forest. He said this line that they have shot and marked with a sign is a half a degree off true north. They established it. We'll use it. Ten years later, the Forest Service resurveyed it, put my main dwelling on the forest. What do you mean by that? Well, they moved the line, and in so moving it, I'm on the wrong side of the new line. How close did you go to the old line when you built your home? Uh, 
about 50 feet. Why did you go so close? How much property do you own? Oh, about over 10 acres. Why did you go so close? Well, it was just the place to build. It was, you know, where I wanted to build. <laughs> All right. So that's, 10, that, that's 27 years ago. You found out the house was perhaps inappropriately placed. That's right. The Forest Service has never legally notified me of this. They put what we call a geodesic survey marker out in my yard, which shows the corner and so on. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> because I'm getting up in years, the kids want me to settle it while I'm alive. I think they're thinking swell. An attorney many years ago said, don't bother him. He's deceased. The next attorney said, let's do it. Current attorney says, don't bother him. So. Well, the thing is that it, it, it could be, could be that you have um, uh, it's not at that time I say earned. You may have acquired some some rights to that property through the the function of eminent uh, for, through the function of uh, adverse adverse possession. Right. I don't. Boy, I'm not thinking very clearly here. Okay. Uh, but but I know. Well, how much? right you've acquired is is pretty hard to prove and then I'm, I'm not sure of this one at all whether it's a different situation when it's a government agency involved as contrasted with a a non-government now having said all that you still got 10 acres right yeah how far is your house from property we can agree because you're, you're you've accepted this survey from 27 years ago have you had it surveyed subsequent to that time no well, you, you see, even even the, the, the ability to survey has improved kind of dramatically over the last few years, yes? Yeah. I mean, uh, for a lot of ways. Actually, well, they've redone it twice. Since, when was the last time it was done? Oh, 20 years ago. Well, why don't you have another survey done to be certain we know what we're talking about? Yeah. Now, the next thing, there's two things you could do. One, you're not going to like at all. How far are you from the, let's assume that the survey shows everything to be correct as we view it right now. How far are you from your property line? Uh, to move it on to what the Forest Service considers is my line? No, well, we, again, we don't know what you're, uh, you're saying. The Forest Service considers that you don't agree with that. But I said, let's assume that that line is a correct one. Okay. How far is your house from, the, from your own property? Oh, Another 50 feet, roughly. Well, you could move the house. Yeah. Is there a basement in the house? No. Well, that shouldn't be too much too expensive to move. If it comes to that. If it comes to that. Yeah. The other thing would be, to, how much is that property worth an acre up there? Oh, well, about 20 grand. Worth that much? Yeah. The lawyer said there's no such thing as adverse possession with the government. Well, that was the question that I raised. Yeah. So I don't know. He said I didn't know that. Yeah. All right. If we can make, we can accept that as a as a as a position. Then the only two other two possibilities is move it or buy it. Would they sell you some property? Yeah. Well, we're down to one possibility, are we? <laughs> I guess. Move it. Yeah. Or let it ride until you know someday it has to be straightened out. But I'll be long gone by then. I mean, well, it won't that, have to be straightened out until it's sold, they tell me. Well, in that case, maybe you, you, you might, from your very selfish position, you might want to say, look, I'm comfortable here. I'll let my heirs worry about it. Yeah, okay. That's a possibility. Yeah. But well, I would have, I'd have it surveyed again to be certain that their line is a correct one. Yeah. All right. Well, I certainly thank you, Bruce. Good luck, my friend. You bet. Bye. Those are things that do happen, though, from, from time to time where... where a survey is, is misread. That's why when you have a lot of property, why locate close to a line where you could have a problem? Covington, Kentucky, Cincinnati suburb. Hello there. Warner. Hi. Hi. Um, I have a problem. Um, we have uh, a thief going around in school. A what? A, a thief. Um, a crook. Yeah, a crook. A snake in the grass. Yeah. Well, there are about 2,000 students in the school. What kind of school? It's a high school. All right. And, um, as I would say, on the air here, um, all the students have locks. Locks what? On the lockers? On the lockers. All right. Okay. And, and every only, student has their own locker. Yes. And their own lock. And obviously different combinations. 
Are they all combination locks? Yeah, they're all combination locks. And lately, recently here at school, there's been someone going around getting into certain people's lockers and stealing coats and valuables out of there. Like, someone got into my locker and took my coat, mm -hmm. and someone got into, into three of my other friends' lockers and stole their coats. All right, is there any way to get in and leave the lock in place? I'm sorry? Is there any way to get into the locker? Without taking the lock off? No, not at all. No, okay. not at all. Cannot be done. Cannot be done. And, like, th there's one way to get the combination. That's going to go into the, the, the head office. But oh, well, wait a minute. Back up. In other words, when you put your locker on there, you have to, to, to give somebody the combination? Yes, the, yes, the uh, office and our homeroom teacher has the combination. All right. Okay? So there's, but, a, master, uh, there's a master list floating correct, around somewhere. Exactly. But the main that's not the problem. The main problem is... We went to the deans today, the two head deans, with the problem. And we approached them and told them what the problem was. We said, uh, someone stole our, our coats out of our lockers. And they were like, do you know who stole the locks? I mean, excuse me, the coats. And we, they, we said no. And then the deans responded by saying, well, we don't either. And they huh. acted in a cocky sense and said that there was nothing they could do and for us to go on our merry way. And um, and then I come to find out. So they, uh, my friends went on our, their merry way, and I come to find out that the deans acted in the in the wrong way because it was up to the dean. We well, when we got home, we called the police the police mm -hmm. to report it because okay. these are three over three hundred dollars in jackets. Well, in that case, you can make an insurance claim. Too. Yeah, well, and that's a felony. Well, forget about that. You can still also make an insurance claim. Okay. Well, for a mysterious disappearance against your parents' homeowners policy. But okay, well. So I mean, I mean, you can't hold the school responsible, right? I would think so. You would think I can or can't. No, I would think that you are correct in that that supposition. Okay, I mean, because now we rent these locks, okay? You do what? We we the school rents all the students the lockers. You gotta pay. You gotta pay for that. Yeah, we have to pay for the locker. Huh. Four dollars for the locker and the lock together. Mm -hmm. So my question is. Well, wait a minute. They, they provide the lock. They provide the lock. And you got to use a company lock. I'm sorry? You have to use a school lock. Yes. And somewhere there's a master list for these yes, things. And that, yes. And or that there's also probably, there's a key in that combination yes, lock. Yes, exactly. There's a master key That's, floating yes. around someplace. You're right. You're right. But my problem was that how the deans responded. We came to find out that there were police on campus and it was the dean's responsibility. I don't disagree. Look, I, if, if you're going to tell me that they responded uh, in an inappropriate way, I, we have nothing to quarrel about. I see. The question is, how does one get them to respond in a more Correct. appropriate way? Yes. Well, yes. The, the one thing would be you might want to chat with, have your parents chat with somebody. Mm -hmm. And I, I think as a parent, if uh, it had been handled this way, I would not be a happy camper. Mm -hmm. On the other side of that, as a parent, I might also want to see how well you as students handled it. I see. And it, yeah, that's that's what we were going to deal with from here on. Well, how, how do you think that I, as a student, should deal with it? Well, you went to the, the appropriate authorities, uh -huh. and you told them of a, of a, of a problem. Mm -hmm. You also went to the police and reported the problem. Yes. And the, and the, uh, the authorities kind of took a cavalier attitude. Yes. On the other side of that, what would we, if, if I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make you the dean for the moment. Yes. How would you respond, and what would you do, if anything? I would do my job. Well, no, that, that's, that's a... Give me some specifics. Okay, I would, I would uh, get the police there to the school, mm -hmm. and there are police on campus. I would go get a police officer, bring them up, and file a complaint or a. Uh, How can you file a complaint? Well, I'm not a complaint. File. What do you call it? You could file a report. A report. That you could do. I would do that, and you know, see what we could do to help. You know, and. Well, uh, but no, wait a minute. You see, you're, you're, you're getting general. I'm trying to put you in a spot. Okay. Well, you have you you have the authority, whatever authority rests with the dean now rests with you. I want to know specifically what would you do. That's probably all I could do is file a report. That's the exactly correct. Hmm. Now, it's, it, w it would appear appear that someone has uh, gotten hold of a of, of a master key. I don't think a list. Mm -hmm. Probably a master key. That's what I'm thinking, yeah. And I can tell you from from uh, some first-hand knowledge, the locks that you're using are pretty cheap. Yep. 
and it would not be hard to, if you knew anything about locks, to get yourself a master key that would spring them. Yeah, I see. And there are some pretty bright kids floating around school. <laughs> yeah. Pretty dumb ones, too. And, and, well, you know what? I'm thinking, why would you have... And maybe I'm missing something. I'm at school, okay? Mm-hmm. What are you doing wearing a $300 coat to high school? Oh, no, it's not that. It's the... I'm just asking the question. It sounds like one of these designer leather jackets, maybe. Well, I mean, I myself don't wear a $300 coat. Well, who lost a $300 coat? No, it's the total of the three coats. Right? Oh. It's about $100. I see. Okay. Three of the coats that have been reported today. Mm-hmm. Total about a little, well, a little over we, Obviously, they ought to, somebody ought to be keeping their eyes on things, huh. if, if not directly, surreptitiously trying to catch someone. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the chances are the coats are going to turn up somewhere. I mean, what good is a coat unless it's either sold or worn? Yeah. And and the market for selling hundred dollar coats is somewhat limited. Would you not agree to that? Mm, yeah. So it seemed to me that, that that they were probably stolen by somebody who was going to wear them. Yeah. So I would make as little fuss, but I keep my eyes open, and I think the administration ought to do the same. And if that doesn't work, then your parents ought to get into it. I'm Bruce Williams. This is Talk Nation. Henryville, Indiana. Hello there. Welcome to TalkNet. Thank you. Uh, how you doing, Bruce? I'm uh, doing very well, thank you. Good. I've got a question or a problem here. My wife uh, was hit by a semi about a year and a half ago. Mm-hmm. And uh, they didn't... Uh, uh, the insurance company, you know, went ahead and found the proper things. Okay, their well, insurance... Well, well, hold on. What, what insurance company? Okay, our them? insurance company, con- you know, got a hold of their insurance company, so on and so forth. Well, why did they do that? Why uh, would... Do you have collision insurance on your car? We got, we have collision and... All right, go ahead. And they said the trucking companies uh, drag it out so long, most of the time, that uh, they went, we went in and fixed our vehicle because we needed it. Yeah, but did you fix it? All right, go ahead. Did you, did you let your insurance company pay for it? Right, we paid, used our collision our paid our deductible okay on it. that's what i wanted to know and then uh we're going to get reimbursed when they paid it you know was there uh where am i going where am i going with all this okay well, well was was the was there subrogation how much damage was done let's start with that uh say about eight hundred dollars no how much okay. deductible five five hundred yeah so you got three hundred bucks well, no, I've got 500 in it. They okay. Their insurance company kicked us back to the company due to the fact that they had a five thousand dollar deductible. The trucking company. Are they allowed to do that in your state? Well, uh, this there's the trucking companies out of Minnesota. So yeah. what we had to do, we had to try to re recoup our losses from uh, the trucking company. Well, absolutely. The heck, you okay. don't throw the insurance company either. Either right. way. Either way, you don't have a claim against the insurance company. No, claim, no, no. I, but no, I, I, how, but I wasn't aware that anybody could carry five thousand dollar deductible liability uh, insurance. I never heard of such a thing. A trucking company evidently did or does. Anyway, uh, what happened is they didn't pay it. It went on so long. Our insurance company said they don't think they're going to be able to collect it, and recommended us going to a small claim. Yeah, well, yeah. Go ahead. Okay, so it went to a small claim. Did, did you collect from your own company the three hundred bucks? No. You didn't collect anything? No. Okay, I, I think that was wise. Go ahead. Okay, so what happened is we went ahead and won the judgment by default. Well, they didn't even show up for the right. small claims. Right. All right, then uh, they filed a pro-sub. A what? Uh, evidently, they that's what uh, they called it. Uh, a pro-what? A pro-sub. Like a, I guess it's a subpoena. And now the, the fleet owner did show up to that who filed this the courts my wife uh went down to the the court the clerk's office and they found this and they evidently they summoned him to appear uh, in the court he did the fleet owner showed up yeah okay and uh they give him like 30 days to file and then then they were refiled again and uh we were getting nowhere with them is there any way that we can Collect. Yeah, let, let, me, let me. I'm. I'm a little confused, so oh, forgive me. I'm sorry. You do have a judgment against them, is that correct? Right. They do business in your state. They drive through our state. Yes. Well, I believe. What, what you usually there's a way that you can serve them through the Secretary of State. 
Now they're doing business in your state where you can, if one of their trucks comes through, you can slap a lien on the truck as it comes through the state. Uh-huh. Let me, I, I, listen, let me, I'm, a, I'm, 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 a, I'm in dangerous ground here. If there's an attorney out there, I'd be really appreciative if you give me a shout. Because this is the kind of thing that can happen. Here's a company that doesn't have any business in the state except they run trucks through. Uh, they're carrying a $5,000 deductible, which I've never heard on a liability insurance, but maybe. But they they have a judgment in place. How do you collect that judgment? Do you have to go back to the home state to collect it? Can you nail their trucks as they go through the state? If you are a legal beagle, and I know a bunch of you are out there, come on now. Your turn. 800. No, check the 800 nonsense. Uh, it's uh, 703-413-8381. Let's try it again. That's 703 703- 413-8381. One more time, 703-413-8381. If uh, you are an attorney and you can help us out, I'd really be grateful. I'm Bruce Williams. This is TalkNet. I have a gentleman from Fort Smith, Arkansas, who is in the trucking business, who has answered my plea. Hello there. Hello. Hey, what's happening, guy? Hey, can Bruce, you... how you doing? Oh, I'm a little c- confused here. How does one handle a thing like this? Well, first of all, all trucking companies that are authorized to do business in a state or any state in order to get their license is required to show proof of liability insurance. And the limits of liability are prescribed by the Interstate Commerce Commission. Well, they're not prescribed, not for the state, but the interstate, huh? Well, over the interstate... If, if they travel across state lines, the ICC establishes the limit you're saying that's exactly right how much to the product that you carry and according to uh, your scope of operating authority can you have a five thousand dollar deductible on liability never in my life have i heard of a five thousand dollar deductible in liability nor have i and if you would check the chances are that there's a either a third or fourth party involved and is how would that be? Tempting, well, it might be a fleet owner who has some trucks licensed to operate under this trucking company's operating authority or something like that. And he has made arrangements, but you check that carrier's base plate, whether it be Arkansas, Oklahoma, or New York. That state is going to require that he have proof of liability insurance before he ever gets his license. So how do we go about What do we do now? Well, uh, in every state that a trucking company operates in, they have serving agents that are on file with the Interstate Commerce Commission oh, in is that right? D.C. In every state they pass through, huh? That's exactly right. And in the event that uh, a lawsuit is to be filed against a trucking company, they can check with the Interstate Commerce Commission and see where that serving agent is and and file a suit through that serving agent. Well, they've already got a judgment. How do they collect it? Well, uh, there's a number of different ways, but most time when there's a judgment pending against a carrier and uh, it's been through all the appeal processes, uh, they will be prohibited from running to that state until the problem is reconciled. Uh, we prohibited by whom? Beg your pardon. Whom would do the prohi- who would do the prohibiting? Uh, the state agency. What? State. What's the? I mean, what agency within the? In other words, well, who does he have to contact in his state to get them to to stop running his state until they pay? Uh, the uh, state corporation commission. Hmm. Write them a letter and say we have a judgment against such and such trucking company, and uh, uh, we have uh, have a judgment, but they haven't uh, satisfied the judgment, and we want you to handle this matter with them. And uh, then, how about the ICC? Could they be any help to them? Well, uh, they they'll refer you to some extent. They can, but. Uh, uh, they'll probably first refer you to that particular state in that judicial system. Mm-hmm. And then if it becomes serious enough, the ICC can revoke the operating permit or whatever until that's resolved. Well, see, there's something stinks here to begin with, this $5,000 
deductible doesn't ring true. I've never I'm heard of a five yeah, thousand. I'm, I'm wondering if they. I'm wondering if the insurance in my lifetime. Yeah, I'm wondering if he, if they actually talked to the insurance company. You might have talked to somebody from their company. as romance. Well, right? I think that somebody's doing a whitewash job on yeah, what they have. It seems so. Thank you very much for joining me, guy. I really appreciate it. All right. Now, oh, my friend out there in, was in Indiana. I think it was. Yes, sir. Do you understand what he just got? He told you. I think I've got most of it down here. Yeah. Okay. And I appreciate the help there. I, I do wish you well, guy. Knoxville, Tennessee. Hello. Yes, enjoy your program, Bruce. Thank you. Um, I'm 27 years old. I have a house in 3.3 acres, and I'm considering building a rent house as an investment. Would like your opinion on that? Not much. Okay. Generally speaking, single-family homes are not particularly good investments. Okay. Uh, even if you're going to do what you're talking about, you'd have to get, the, or you wouldn't have to, it would be wise to get the property subdivided. Right. So you'd be on a separate lot, separate deed, all that sort of thing, which costs money. Right. But are you, are you going to build a single family or multiple family? Uh, just single family. Uh, so I, it's unlikely you can make any money. Okay. I appreciate it. M multiple family housing can be a decent investment in terms of rental. Single family seldom is. Okay. Thanks so much. You're very welcome. Bradenton, Florida. Hello there. Good evening, Bruce. First yes, of all, it's an honor to have a couple moments of your time. Well, you're very, very generous. Thank you. And uh, I have a situation that has arisen in the last couple of months, and uh, I'd really like an additional opinion on it. The, uh, the problem started back in July when uh, my wife and I were vacationing out in uh, San Francisco, mm -hmm. and we called a San Francisco pier line that uh, governed cruises uh, and tours going out to Alcatraz. Yeah, I know that there's only one company that does that. Right. Well, you know the one I'm dealing with. Yeah, I was out there this summer. Oh, really? Yes, sir. I, every time I go to San Francisco, I go to Alcatraz. I don't know why. It's, I'll tell you, it was uh, definitely educational, especially the, uh, the audio tour. Oh, isn't that something? Else, you, know, you put the earphones on, you know, oh. the, the clank of the prisoners walking down a hall and so forth. And the trays in the mess hall. Anyone yeah. who does that tour should take the audio tour. Absolutely. Yeah. Anyways, getting back, we had uh, made reservations over the phone while we were staying uh, in the area. Mm -hmm. And at the time, I had my wife's credit card. And what it is, it's a, um, uh, a checking account debit card that's actually under a major credit company where any purchase made on that card is actually deducted from my checking account. Well, it's a debit card, not a credit card. Correct. There's a difference. Exactly. Okay, if this one here is a debit card. All right. I had used her card in making the reservations. On the day of our tour, I showed up at the prepaid window and I presented my card. The gentleman could not find the reservations made under that number. We finally came to the realization that the last two digits on each of our cards is different. So what he did is he canceled the phone reservations and initiated a new reservation under my card. At the time, it seemed so simple and the obvious way to do it, not knowing that I would encounter some problems in the past. Well, what you're, what you're going to have, apparently you're going to get double bill. Exactly. And my statement showed actually on my wife's account a debit for seventy-two dollars, which was the cost uh, of the uh, of the tour. Um, no, wait, let me see. That's about four or five tickets. Yeah, actually seven. I think okay. it was three adults and four children. Okay. Which is you know very reasonable, and it came out to that amount. Mm -hmm. And it showed a, a debit on her account on July thirtieth. Mm -hmm. Then it showed a credit on hers on the thirty-first. Then it showed another debit on the 30th. Yeah, for yours or for hers? No, for hers. Right. How about yours? On mine, it showed a debit on August the 2nd, the $72. Right. Which, if you figure it out, again... Yeah, obviously, you're down 72 bucks. Exactly. Well, we contacted the bank, and I wrote them a nice letter on September the 6th, explaining the situation and outlined the whole ordeal. They called my wife about a week later and they said, okay, what we will do is we will credit you the $72, which now it. makes it even, until we contact the company and investigate it. Temporarily, yeah. Exactly. Well, we just got our bank statement and they had debited from the 31st the $72, which puts me in the $72 deficit again. Right. 
This evening, I contacted that particular cruise line, and I spoke to one of their representatives, and they said that to go ahead and forward them all the information, the copy of the letter, the bank statements, etc., and they will look into it. Mm -hmm. And I asked her, you know, now it's getting down to my word versus the bank, and if they would have any record... Well, not versus the bank. Well, versus the institution that no. handles the account. No, I don't agree with that at all. How can I prove that the error well first of all oh, no wait a minute the the error may have well I'm, it would appear if your story you see you they could somebody say yeah this guy's got eight kids and four adults you know which doesn't seem very reasonable right but it would it would appear that the average person looking at this could say yeah there was a double bill here the same card was used twice or the same account was used twice in the same day okay but i don't think the bank made the mistake i think probably the the uh the company out there Put the somebody put the, the the charge through twice. Okay, that was that was one of my questions to you. Now the next thing is, obviously, because the bank debiting me the second time after several months have passed, uh, who is going to be responsible for finding this? I mean, well, you're going to have to follow up on it. Okay, they're never going to do it for you. But, but I, I think mean, the, the cruise line, I think you'll will find they're pretty reasonable people to uh, they, and, and they would have the resources to go ahead and determine what exactly happened and present well it wouldn't that take it well you see you say you're putting it like they're going to do all this paper trailing mm -hmm. if that came across my desk in our business and we take a look and say hey it's clear what happened here we just build them twice let's issue a credit and get it over with right I don't think they, they're going to give you a hard time. If they do, you have to write back to them. But the, pro, the, the credit card company is not the people. They're not the people that made the error here, I don't think. The two bills were put for, put through, and they ought to, what would you do? You, you, you put them through. Mm -hmm. So at this point, it appears as though it was just an oversight on the, on the cruise line. I would think so. Yeah. Okay. Good luck, guy. I'm glad you enjoyed the tour. It is sensational. I'm Bruce Williams. This is TalkNet. <laughs> Middleborough, Mass. Hello there. How you doing, Bruce? I'm doing real well, thank you. I'm calling about an automobile. All right. And uh, I bought the automobile about uh, two weeks ago, uh, the 11th, uh, 11th of this month. New Last car, month. new or used? Uh, used. All right. You buy it from a dealer or a private party? Dealer. All right. How, and, old, uh, how old the car? Uh, it's a 94. 94? Yep. Oh, boy. Uh, they haven't got the title, no registration yet for me. All right. I asked them to take the vehicle back. Why? Uh, well, they ain't got a title for me or anything. Well, I mean, can they... Well, I went to the law in your state about the time the dealer takes to provide a title. I don't know that. Oh, uh, usually, yeah, it takes... Uh, usually, I, every time I bought a vehicle, in the next day or two days afterwards, I usually have registration and everything. This mm -hmm. guy's not registered or anything yet. Well, so, why is... I mean, I mean, you're, you're, tell me why. I don't know. The dealer ain't told me why yet. Well, have you asked him? Yep. And what does he say? Well, the title, as far as they concern, is the, the, uh, the bank still got it. Well, that's very possible because the car was probably financed. What was it a repossession? No, no. The guy had traded in for another vehicle. Why did he trade in a 94 already? Well, he traded in because he wanted a king cab with a four-wheel drive. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the likelihood is that he hasn't been able to provide a... Uh, a title because you had to pay it off. It takes time to get it out of the, the lender's vault. Well, it usually takes. Uh, they usually do it in the next two, two or three days. Well, you say usually. I don't know if that's true or not. No, well, that's that's, what that's my... in your experience. Mm -hmm. But you say I don't know what your state requires in this respect. Do you, I mean, you're you're just going by past experience, which is fine mm -hmm. as far as it goes. But I think you need more than that. Well, they told me it would be ready. Uh, uh, when I bought the vehicle, they told me it would be ready on. Uh, the Tuesday. They should. They said. Oh, I'd have are you money. unhappy with the car? Are you unha unhappy with the car? No. Nope. Excuse me. Are you unhappy? Well, with I'm unhappy in the situation because I mean, you know, I, I, I understand. No, wait a minute. I'm mm -hmm. separating things. I know you're unhappy with the situation. Are you unhappy with the car? No, I'm not. You don't want to kill the deal, then. No. Well, then why don't you get down to the dealer and see if you get a decent explanation out of him? Well, then uh, I, I did. Uh, they told me what well, you're going to have to keep waiting. In the meantime. I can't drive this vehicle on my plates. Well, can you? Do you have plates on it? I got dealer plates. Oh, what difference does it make? Well, they say my. I don't know how true it is. In Massachusetts, you cannot drive around dealer plates. Well, I don't think I, the dealer plates are made to use for temporary conditions. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think you're getting upset, maybe over nothing. You, did you, you paid for the car, did you not? 
Excuse me? Did you did you pay for the car? I'm financing through the bank. Through the dealer's bank or your bank? A dealer's bank. I wouldn't worry about it. No. Well, I ain't got no insurance or anything on it. What do you mean you don't have any insurance? I don't. Why? Because they can't get the papers into the insurance company to insure. Well, yeah, the dealer's plates are on there. Is that correct? Correct. And there, the plates are insured. They're, they are, right. I wouldn't worry about it too much. No. I think what's happened here is that the car was financed, and they're having they have they, they have to pay it off. Mm-hmm. And they well, obviously they got the the the, the, the well no not obviously I'm, but I think it's obvious that the the lend the dealer's bank has already put up the money for you. In your case, I don't think you have much to worry about. The insurance thing would give me some concern, but the dealer's place, I'm quite sure, adequately insured. Dean Everett is twisting the dials. Always a pleasure to work with Dean. He's got final exams. I'm keeping his mind on both jobs. Ain't easy. Dallas Riggin in Master Control. Mr. Paul Hill is our operations manager. And, of course, the redoubtable Dan Rudd, our producer. Hey, it's not easy, campers, but give it your best shot. Try and do what's right. I'm Bruce Williams. Keep in touch problem because once you report it the fact that you go over a mileage number doesn't uh, remove re, doesn't remove their responsibility but you know I'm not so sure that there is you don't have a tire but these are front or rear tires well we got off we got four new ones How much as the tires wear the vibration gets a lot worse and it's starting again I wait a minute, just take a deep breath <laughs> take a deep breath now you said you spent two hundred dollars Right. How'd you get four tires for two hundred bucks? Well, it's uh, our local mechanic, and he gave us the tires for fifty dollars a piece. Pretty cheap. Are they are they radials or bias tires? Um, bias ply. I don't know. That I don't know. Well, I'm not so sure. You don't have a tire problem. What do you think of that? Or, or have an alignment problem, one or the other. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no reason to wear out tires at 30,000 miles. So that's why I asked if they were a uh, bias plier radial. Mm -hmm. I s suspect they were radial, but I don't know that. Uh, all season? I don't know. They're radials. Okay. They shouldn't go in 30,000 miles. Okay. Uh, either I, I would think that you probably have an alignment problem. Did they check that? Um, the first time we took it back to them, they told us that the tires weren't balanced. Yeah. And they balanced them, and it still vibrated, but not as bad. And then when we took it back for an oil change, um, we get the tires rotated there as well. And right. we had the oil changed, and I said to him, it's really vibrating bad. And he would not test drive at more than 55 miles an hour. That's a lot of crap. So, so you go, but when he goes home to dinner, he does over 65, 55 well, miles an hour. you know, we try to tell him that there are places down south that go more than 55. Down south, you go right next door. You're in Pennsylvania. You're right into Virginia. Yeah, though they didn't want to hear it. My husband called back and said he would test drive it with them. He would drive it and be responsible for a ticket. Mm -hmm. And they did confirm it. We have paperwork confirming that, yes, they, they're they duplicating the fact that there is a vibrating noise and, and the front end is really shaking mm -hmm. when you go over 55. But or no, or my question to you is, is it worth it at this point to get an attorney? No. But I'd go to, I, I would go to the, the Better Business Bureau for binding arbitration which I'm sure your dealer subscribes to. Just call the Better Business Bureau and tell them what they're probably, you want to go to arbitration. Okay, That's now. It. I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Are, is there um, anything the Attorney General's office can do? No, ma'am. This no, is strictly a consumer problem. The Attorney General has no business getting involved. Okay. Strictly a consumer problem. Okay, don't they try to resolve your complaint, though? Or? I don't think so. I would hope not. Okay, well, the letter that they sent said that the viewer will attempt to resolve your complaint. Well, but, okay. I mean, maybe they do. I, I well, would think they don't that's... get involved as far as legally, and I understand that. It, it, it doesn't that, but... seem to me that, that's an, that, that that would be an appropriate uh, activity of, a, of, a, of an AG. Mm -hmm. This is a civil matter. you got a difference of opinion as to what's wrong here. I, as I say, if we're me, yeah, you, have, you, have you talked to the zone representative of... No, oh, that, I mean this full. Let's call the 800 number for the deal for the for the manufacturer. Yeah, honey, that isn't what I asked you. Did you talk to the zone rep? No. And you said no. Well, you should. You should request your dealer to make an appointment to talk to the zone rep. Okay. And also, and then from that, if if, the, if he or she can't satisfy you, 
then you want to go to the Better Business Bureau. And you also want to write the, the manufacturer as well as the dealer a certified letter making them aware that this complaint is made well within the, the uh, guarantee period so that if you go out of guarantee that this, this complaint has been uh, no, so right. noted so it's still covered. Right. I do wish you well, baby. Thank you very much. Hang in. I'm Bruce Williams. Bye. This is Talk Dead. We go to Des Moines, Iowa to say hi. Hi, Bruce. Hello there. Um, I need your help in hooking out the right cruise to Alaska for my 70-something-year-old parents to go on. I, I'm overwhelmed with the choices, and I well, need to know where the, how important the cabin location is. Less, not very important. Okay. So um, having a port at hole, it doesn't make one bit of difference one way or the other. I can not, put on an interior. Not in my opinion, it doesn't. Okay. Now, when the cruise does... Is there a lot of scenic stuff just from the boat, or do, is there a lot of walking when they do the port call? There are both. There's plenty of uh, plenty of stuff that you see from the boat, Glacier Bay, as an example. Magnificent. Glacier Bay? Okay. You'll go to, trust me on that, if you're going to go on a cruise, you go to Glacier Bay. Okay. You're going to go up the Inland Passage and that sort of thing. Okay. And uh, But there are also, you're going to stop at places like Juneau, Ketchikan, maybe Sitka, I don't know, depending on what ship you're on. Okay, but Glacier Bay for sure, I need to make sure that's included. I, and, no, it's, honey, listen to me. Uh -huh. It's always included. Great. Okay. What about the time? What time is the better time to go? July. July. Great. Thank you very maybe, much. Maybe August. Now, wait a while. Slow down. Okay. But you also might want to consider a bus tour as well. Oh. Well, as long as you're going to send them. Mm hmm. Whereas they, if they go up, they take the, they can, you can do it either way. Okay. But if you go from, say, Vancouver up to, I forget what it is, it's a, I forgot the name of it. What, do you have the brochure in front of you? What's the last stop? Uh, no, I do not. I'm stuck. I was oh, telling you. Okay, it's okay. I'm stuck in a snowstorm here, and I'm calling you for my mobile. In a snowstorm? <laughs> yes. A where, rush hour ice storm, and my car quit working, so I'm... Where asleep. in heaven's name are you in a snowstorm? In Des Moines, Iowa. Oh, you poor child. <laughs> oh, boy. Now, now I know why I'm not in Des Moines. <laughs> Right. Boy, well, you know, it's, it's, it's so a, I wish that I weren't. It was about 82 today. I, I don't want to hear about it. <laughs> but in any event, uh, the, you can you see you can take the let's let's assume that you start out in the, mm -hmm. the lower end in Vancouver, then you take the, the you take a week's cruise, then you can go on a bus trip for a week or ten days. Great. And as long as you're up there, you may as well go for the extra the extra time and money if you can possibly afford it. You bet. Or you go up to you go up to uh, uh, up as far as Fairbanks. And uh, all kinds of good stuff the, uh, through the, the park and whatever. As long as she's going to get that far. Why don't you go with her, by the way? Got to stay home to pay for it. Well, that's another, that's another program. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, you so stand much. there and just keep that ice away from me. Okay. Thanks, Bruce. Take care, baby. Houston, Texas, your turn. Hello. Hello. Hello there. Hi. Um, I was calling to inquire about the situation. I, uh... About, I guess, September, I had got a roommate and we had got an apartment together. Right. Now, um, the, everything was put under his name um, the, as far as all the deposits, electricity, water, uh, the apartment in general. You know, everything was under his name. Why was that? Uh, because my I, I had a bad credit rental thing at once. Stinko credit, huh? Yeah, about four or five years ago in Houston. I came back here, so... So I'm kind of stuck with that down here. And so we got that and um, about two weeks ago, which is almost uh, almost three months in our lease, which was a year lease, uh, there was an uh, issue that was brought up and basically... Uh, what issues were brought up? Uh, it, was, it was like personal stuff and we basically got an argument. You, woman, well, don't give me basically what happened. Oh uh, well. <laughs> no, you, 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 I, 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 well, no, you're talking around it. I'm not trying to pick on you, but you're saying issues are that doesn't tell me anything. What okay. happened? Well, the the issues that were brought up is uh, I thought he was gay, and I don't really like gays. All right. So and so. At so that, you want to move out? Huh? You want to move out? Well, he, see, he he wanted me to leave, and he claims he did not kick. And it was under his name, so I left. Now, he claims he did not kick me out because he never said I'm kicking you out, but he wanted me to leave, and a couple of days afterwards, he had locked the, changed the locks on the doors and everything, so it was more than obvious that I was kicked out. Now, do I have any right to any of that deposit money that I had 
Did you, oh yeah, how much did you put in? Uh, all together, probably about six, six hundred dollars, seven hundred dollars. How much more is on the lease? How, how much, much more? In other words, how, you were in there for one year. No, we were. I was in there for like two, three, three months, three months. But how long does the lease run? Was it for a, month? a year? It's for a year. And he's willing to, to he's to stay on the lease, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, you have an interest in it, but he could make the take the position that that uh, you induced him. I mean. It, <laughs> You guys just had a big old blast and a brawl, and he got you got out, huh? Yeah, yep. And uh, I mean, he wanted me to leave, and I really had I figured I had no legitimate reason, legally, you know, to uh, say I am staying here and you're leaving. So. Well, oh, no, you couldn't say that, certainly. You, I don't, I don't know that I don't know that he had a right to throw you out either. Hmm. But uh, have you asked him for for your share of the deposit? Uh, I have, and 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 even uh, earlier this summer, he had owed me a couple hundred dollars, and I never got that from him. Um, and I can't prove I gave it to him. It's like I really can't prove that I gave him the, the deposits and stuff. Well, the thing is, if you were to go to small claims court, uh -huh. uh, I, I think that you'd have a reasonable shot. Yeah. Uh, but you're saying that, but the, but the, the spin here is that he threw you out. He well, I mean, he he told me he wanted me to leave, and I left. Well, that's is that because they're throwing out? Well, would be. he said specifically, "I want you out of here." Yeah. Well, he said, "I don't want to live." I, I, we need to keep our distance. It's best that we don't live together. I say it again. It's best that we don't live together. Well, you're te you're really you're starting to temper this quite a bit now. A minute ago, was he threw you out? Then it was he wanted you to leave. Now it's it's best we don't live together. Now what is it? Okay, he said. I think I think we need to keep our distance. It's best we don't live together. And the following couple of days, he changed the locks on the house. Well, that's pretty solid. I I, I think I'd give him a call and say I'd like my money, my two hundred as well as my half of the deposits, or you go to small claims court and let a jurist decide. Good luck, I'm Bruce. This is Talk Net. News Radio. Columbia City, Indiana. Hello there. Welcome to my world. Mr. Williams, thank you for taking my call. You're welcome. Mr. Williams, I have a construction nightmare I hope you can help me with. <laughs> construction uh, nightmare, huh? Absolutely a nightmare. Um, it's kind of a complicated story. I'll try to make it simple. Six years ago, I hired a contractor to put a second story on my home obviously involved cutting the roof off and putting the second story on. Mm -hmm. um, did you have an architect or something design this thing? or No, I did not. How did you go about getting plans? Just, um, just drew them up on a, uh, <clears throat> on a regular piece of paper you know, huh. just with a floor plan. Basically, a floor plan was all that we had at the time. Could you get permits in your area? Yes, sir. Well, yes, that's, sir. That's surprising. I, I submitted the plans uh, for the permits then. Mm -hmm. all, all that they required at that point was a floor plan, uh, since the uh, the foundation was was not being altered. Um, anyway, we we put uh, we put the second story on, and um, you know had it inspected and so on and so forth. And last week, I hired another contractor to remodel my kitchen. And part of the remodeling job was to include taking down the ceiling and putting up new drywall. When we took the ceiling down, we discovered uh, very major uh, and serious code violations that occurred during the original construction. As for example? Uh, well, the, the, they're numerous. Uh, first of all, and, and the most major, the uh, code calls for two by tens for the floor joists. Yeah. The original ceiling rafters were two by sixes. What the contractor did was put two by fours on top of the two by sixes and then scabbed them together uh, about every five feet with a uh, about an 18 inch piece of two by 10. Mm -hmm. uh, we have uh, some major code violations in terms of plumbing and electrical. Um, so how this how this get past the? Uh, I I don't have any idea, sir. I don't know. The building department. I don't know. That's that's one of the the mystery questions at this point. Um, we also have found that in cutting the roof off, the main support beam that was in the ceiling, um, the contractor at the time cut that in half. So the structural integrity of that has been damaged. Why did he cut it in half? Uh, apparently, an error when he cut huh. the roof off. Is that right? Yes, sir. Um, my my problems arise, obviously, be, you know, from structure damage um, to uh, 
uh, electrical plumbing code violations and so on and so forth. The contractor that did the job has filed bankruptcy three times in this period. How can you file bankruptcy three times? He changed the name of his corporation, opened a new corporation, and then filed bankruptcy on that corporation. He's had three companies. He's, he's, three well, he's, companies. He's, he's had two. He's currently in a, in a third one. It has not been dis dismissed yet. Hmm. Um, How much is it going to take to get this thing, put this thing straight? Between sixty and seventy thousand dollars. The uh, construction problems that we have are to the, de the degree that the experts that I have talked to, number one, uh, say that, that theoretically the house should be condemned. Uh, number two, that in order to fix it correctly and have anybody guarantee their work, the whole second story is going to have to come off and be redone. What did What did you pay to have this done originally? Uh, Thirty-two thousand. Now, my problems arise when, when I talk to my insurance company, my particular insurance covers collapse. However, it has not fallen down, so I'm not covered with my insurance. No, uh, even, if it, even, even if it did, it did collapse, I'm not sure they'd honor it. You know, that, you know, that may be. Um, apparently, uh, his insurance had lapsed at the time of his construction, so he has no insurance. Um, our recourse, we thought, was the uh, the building inspector inspecting the property and signing off on it. You're looking for somebody to help you, I'm right? I'm looking for somebody to help me, and I'm not getting anywhere. Um, it, state statute says that we cannot sue the building inspector. They say that we have to go after its agent, which would obviously be the uh, county commissioners. Um, today, I find out through my attorney that the county commissioners have blanket immunity, so they have no responsibility for it. Why do they have blanket immunity? I don't know, sir. See, this is the, a, another case of doing all the things when you began with this thing. You had no architect, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you're, you're cutting corners, and as you can see, it, it's not a very smart thing to do. Yes, sir, I can. And no, no plans, no nothing. I mean, yeah. I, I don't even know how you could sue anybody. Uh, they, I think their defense would be you were so grossly negligent in what you did. And clearly the builder's not going to help you any because he's got nothing. No, sir. The company that you did business with is no longer exists. They went, they went belly up. And I would assume that he has nothing personally. That's correct. I don't know where you're going to go. Um, how come it's going to cost 70000 to to fix something that only cost 32 to begin with? Well, um, apparently the, the lumber cost has escalated tremendously in the last, uh, particularly in the last three years. Mm -hmm. That and the fact that they have to uh, tear the whole second story off. Well, I'd be reluctant to agree to have it all torn off. I mean, you, was that because of the joy situation? Yes, sir. Why well, couldn't you that, do that in the ceiling. Uh, there's well, let's problems. start. Let, let's start with a joist. Why couldn't you just parallel it with with two by tens? Parallel the existing joist with two by tens. I wouldn't take them out. Okay. it would be a hell of a lot cheaper just to parallel them. I mean, the place is standing there. We know that. Mm -hmm. If you parallel them, that would put you in code, and it would also give you a lot of strength. You build girders that way, don't you? Well, you do. Uh, I'm uh, telling uh, you, the uh, answer uh, is you do. You, okay. If you put two two by tens together, you got a four by ten. Mm -hmm. Well, there's no reason why I don't think you couldn't parallel them. Now, as to the the one they cut up on top, I don't know what the story is up there, but I'll bet that could be. Well, that, that that is in that was the top of the first home, mm -hmm. so that's that's running in between the floor and the ceiling now. now I don't know. You know. The other problem is the, the rafters in the roof um, do not sit flush with the uh, with the beam in the roof. What do you mean they don't sit? Flush? Well, they they cut them at at a, at a uh, an angle that does that does not fit flush with the uh, with the beam. And what they did was they they stuffed um, um, just um, pieces of wood in there. To hold it up. I mean, it kind of shimmed it up, it huh? shimmed it up, yes, sir. But these are just two-by-fours, right? 
Um, and the ceiling there are two by sixes. Same thing. Why couldn't you just cut parallel pieces and make a girder? Mm-hmm. And, 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 and put the appropriate angle in. That would give you the strength, and they could be married together. I don't see why that to be torn out. Okay. Well, maybe not, but if the, if the mm-hmm. building codes are as loose as you described, mm-hmm. I'll see why you couldn't do that. What is your opinion on the uh, uh, responsibility of the building? I think that you're, that, that you're wasting your time for the most part. Getting to, to sue a government agency at any level, unless they agree to be sued, is a very difficult thing. Mm-hmm. Now, whether they, and whether they're responsible is another story altogether. But again, you, you see, you, your laws, wherever you built this, are so loose. If you don't have to even submit a, 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 a decent set of plans... You know, to build something, a back of an envelope kind of thing. I, you know, right. I, I thought that went out about the, the Gettysburg Address. I mean, I'm not real big for government, but I, I don't think it's unreasonable to ask for at least a decent sketch on what the materials are going to be. Mm-hmm. I doubt seriously you get very far. Well, yeah. The sketch that was supplied to him was, uh, was, was certainly adequate as far as the, the room divisions, and then they were also supplied the material list from the, yeah. uh, from the builder. And the material list does say two by tens, mm-hmm. but obviously he didn't use them. No, I was using that as an example of as an example of, of, of what seems to be pretty loose loose laws and, and the way they're applied. But in any case, I don't know what to tell you. But I do think that that could be repaired for a ton less than you're telling me. Uh, you know, oftentimes the, you get guys and oh, we're going to tear the whole thing out and start again. Well, that's all very well if, if it was their money. I don't think they'd do it that way. And I don't see why you couldn't you couldn't run parallel beams in most cases, marry them together, you have plenty of strength. I do wish you well. I'm Bruce Williams. This is Talk Net. Hello there, St. Louis. Welcome to my world. Good evening, Bruce. Thanks for taking my call. Well, you're very welcome. We ought to pass a little note on. We had a civil engineer call yes. uh, that said that the last fellow, what he ought to do is go to a civil engineer and it could be repaired. Well, that's a, I'm, I didn't say go to an engineer, but I said essentially the same thing. There's no reason to tear that stuff out. That could be repaired for a whole lot less than, than the numbers he was describing. Okay, what's on your mind? Well, it's nice that uh, you give such consideration to each caller. Um, what's on my mind is um, my husband and I got married a couple of months ago, and prior to when we met, he had um, not filed his income tax. Nifty. Yeah, it's wonderful. Um, since then, he has spoken with the IRS, and they have uh, an agreed-upon amount that he pays each month, and that includes all pe- all interest and penalties. Um, how much? Uh, it's 932 bucks about. A month? Yes. For how many years? Um, it's We're down to about uh, 20 grand now. Okay. Um, my question is, <clears throat> my credit is clear. I owe nothing. I own my home, um, <clears throat> and I don't want to get in trouble with the IRS in any way. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a home equity uh, loan, and I was wondering, <clears throat> we were thinking that uh, in April, on the April payment, we would pay off the remaining amount that he owes simply because I don't want the IRS nosing around my stuff. Mm-hmm. This is the first time that we will have filed. Why don't you file separately? Um, we can. I would. Okay. I would also keep my affairs completely separate from his. I Finan- have. Financial. Well, but, but, but you're talking about taxes. Why would you file jointly then? Well, um, that was my question. There may be some here. tax advantage, but I would not just now. Okay. Not as long as he's, because uh, he's, he, let's face it, he is going to be suspect for a long time. Right, exactly. So why do you want to, why would you want to get your... You'd be in the same barge. Now, you, you're intimating that maybe there's something that uh, you're taking a few liberties with your taxes. No, no, absolutely no? not. Um, <clears throat> I just, um, I guess I have a, a, a very nice income, and I've always paid. And um, mm-hmm. How, I mean, this is what is this? A, 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 how do I put this? A later in life marriage? Um, well, I'm 35. That's not like. Oh, really. and how old is he? Uh, 29. First time out for both of you guys? Uh, his first time, my second. Mm-hmm. How did he wind up owing so much money? Um, <clears throat> He just didn't pay, I guess, for like four years or so. And he was making good money. And, he, you know, it was just not smart on his behalf. But um, Downright stupid. Yeah, uh, uh, that's exactly what I'd say. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, his other credit, he's fine. He has no other outstanding, you know bills of any sort this is the only thing how long you guys been married uh, about five months you sure about what you're just telling me 
Yes, absolutely. There's no other option because oftentimes people get surprised when they marry somebody and they find out, ooh. No, no, we have talked about it. He did have some previous hospital bills that has all been paid off. Um, well, talking about it is one thing, but I mean, I'm, I'm <laughs> the only, but the only information you have is what he's telling you. Is that what you're telling me? Um. Yes, and I, you know, he showed shown me the paid off statements to the hospital, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Are you suggesting that there's something that I should do? Well, if somebody has been as irresponsible as he apparently has been, I'd be inclined to run a credit check. Okay, I can do that. I know you can. Um, you know, I would have done that before you got married, very frankly. Yeah, well, we did do a prenuptial. Um, and, you know, got that together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you had something he had nothing, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Well, that was smart. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I mean, He may be clean as the driven snow. Yeah. Yeah, but he may not. Who knows? My, I'm just, I guess I'm a naturally suspicious person. Right. How long did you know this guy before you got uh, married? Three years. Well, it's long enough. Yeah. You're, and, um, you knew all about the tax problem before you got yeah, here? Yeah, that was <clears throat> definitely out in the open. And, Can I uh, ask you a silly question? Yes. Why didn't you resolve that before you got married? Uh, well, we, we had talked about how we were going to handle it. and. Um, well, I said resolve it. Well, it, it is resolved in terms of... Mm, it's not, not resolved, it's paid off. Well, okay, correct. It has not been resolved, but the approach and the... Yeah, you know, okay. It sounds like he's being honorable. I mean, you know, I just hope he is. Yeah, yeah. But it just occurs to me that if we're, if I were counseling you, for whatever reason, I would tell you to keep your affairs completely separate. Separate credit cards, separate bank accounts, separate everything. Okay, that's the way it is at this point. You know, I'd keep it that way. <laughs> even, even to using your credit in your, in your former name. Okay, really? Mm-hmm. But time being, you can always switch. Okay. When you're out socially, you're Mrs. John Smith, if that's what you want to be known mm -hmm. as. But uh, as far as your credit card, it's Millie Jones. Okay. Um, tell me also, what do you think about taking this home equity and <clears throat> paying off the remaining? I think that's amount? a major. I think that's a mistake. A you big got a, mistake. Yeah, you got a prenup because you wanted to keep your affairs separate. Yeah. Now you're going to hock your house to pay off his taxes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, doesn't that fly in the face of the of the yes. prenup? Yes, but I see it does. Well, then I wouldn't do it. Okay, is there would the IRS have any reason? Because you know, having them nose around is not a pleasure. No, it's not. And um, is there any reason? I mean, I file. I have an accountant, and he does my stuff, and everything's on the up and up. Um, any reason for what? I don't know. <clears throat> well, do you say you kept saying any reason, but you didn't finish the sentence? Well, any reason. You know how they just like do spot checks. I mean, if if my husband has had a, a I problem. think that if you are married to this guy, your returns will get more attention than because of his name being on the returns. Okay, so file separately. If for me, unless there's a huge tax disadvantage, and then I'd think about it, I'd file separately. For okay. me, I wish you well, sweetheart. All right, thanks a lot. I'm Bruce Williams. Hang in for more. This is Talk Net. We go down to San Marcos, Texas. Hello there. Welcome to TalkNet. Hello, Bruce. Hi. Thank you for taking my call. Well, you're most welcome. Okay. I had a, a question for you. Uh, my wife and I are looking at buying our second house. And uh, the house that we're in now, it, it, we've only been here a year, but uh, it's a little small. And we found a new house. Anyways, uh, we're fixing to make an offer on it. And we've been talking with several mortgages companies. And the question of an, IR, uh, an ARM or a, just a conventional loan mm -hmm. has come up. Well, how long are you planning on keeping this house? Well, see, that's, we, we don't really have any set. Well, you got to have some right. set, some idea. I mean, you, you just can't flounder around. Serious. Right. Well, well, I'm not going to tell you, you have to, that anybody's going to put a gun to your head and make you but, that, adhere to it. But how long do you... Well, let's, let's start another way. What do, you, what do you do for a living? Yeah, I'm a teacher. How long do you plan on staying in that school system? Um, for, you know, three to five years. You know, that's, no, that, that's it? Well, you know, I don't have any plans of moving. You know, we, we both have steady jobs. You have tenure? Are we're, you tenured? We're settled down here. Uh, not yet. I've been here. This is my first year here. Hmm. But I'm a six-year teacher. Well, and I, we, like, we like where we are. And as far, you know, as far as our plans right now, we're planning on staying here. Well, the, the point I'm trying to raise is that there is a break point where it doesn't pay to buy a house. Right. There's also a break point where it pays to very definitely go with ARMs. There's another place where it probably does not pay. So you gotta, you're got you going to have to come up with something, Teach. Okay. 
Well, let, let's say we're, we're planning on staying here 10 years. All right. In that case, there's a very good possibility that a fixed rate is the way to go. Okay. Now, what kind of an ARM option have you been offered? Well, we have uh, the one that, that we were just recently told was 6.9% uh, based on the cost of funds index. Well, it's 7%. All right, go ahead. Okay. But, assuming that but the cost of funds is going to go up. Okay. I mean, there's not much question about that. Right. We already had a couple of raises. There's going to be more. All right, go ahead. For how long? Uh, That's for one year probably or less. Yeah, it was based on a year, and it would go up one point per year with a maximum of five points. So that goes to, could go to 12%. Right. What is the... the uh, what kind of a, of a fix have you been offered? 9.5. Well, they're going up, aren't they? They sure are. Well, you can sit down, and it shouldn't be, be too difficult for you to do this. You'll be able, you should be able to sit down and figure out where the lines cross. Okay. Do you know what I'm saying? Yes. Now, all you can assume when you're doing this computation, uh, as I see it, is to assume that you're going to get the maximum rate increase every year. Okay. If you don't, I mean, it's it's going to skew the, 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 the computations. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes. But you'll see where the lines cross. Okay. And one other quick question. Yeah, we got 15 seconds. What is it? Okay. The other... Uh